uh, the uh, other compact items. But we did not want to let a meeting go by without advancing the ball on the revenue uh, discussion as well as uh, the regional housing enterprise, we've called it. So what you have in your packet is a term sheet for the regional housing enterprise that is uh, trying to lay out that idea uh, along the same structural lines you're used to seeing. And then you've got a couple of, uh, I would call them very dense uh, picture charts uh, that I'm going to have to walk you through. And I'm going to do that first. Um, the old saying is that time is money. Uh, and I, I want to talk about time before I get to the money here. Um, because I, I think, as Leslie indicated in her introduction, we need to start thinking forward now. Uh, about how the CASA Compact, which I'm going to make the assumption will get done and we will like, uh, moves forward. Um, right now, as you can see on the screen, uh, we're in the development phase. Uh, we hope we're near the end of the development phase. Uh, and then we are into the advocacy phase after that. And we will need to pass several bills in Sacramento uh, to implement uh, the CASA Compact. Um, hoping we are successful in doing that next year, uh, the year after that is a presidential election. And it's a presidential election that is, I think, entirely uh, conceivable uh, will have record levels of turnout, uh, which means it will be a very good election to consider uh, revenue measures like ours. Um, it also means that uh, just about everybody and their brother will be having the same idea. Um, so if we want to try to carve out some room in that election in the Bay Area uh, for a significant boost in funding for what the compact is going to stand for, uh, we need to start creating that elbow room now, in my opinion. Um, and the analysis that I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is a step toward uh, trying to figure that out. Um, we don't just have one election, though. We have them every couple of years here in the United States. So uh, after 2020 year, but we have another one in 2022, which is a second opportunity for measures that we might want to put on the ballot uh, in terms of raising revenue toward the, remember, it's about a billion and a half dollar annual shortfall uh, at minimum for what CASA is going to cost. So I, I wanted to lay that out in time. We're calling these the work windows, uh, and they are very separate and distinct activities. Development, advocacy, electioneering, uh, we've got to get good at all three um, if we're going to get CASA not only uh, signed but delivered. So I apologize. These are not in the right order, so I'm going to put them in the right order now, which is roughly backwards uh, from what you have in your packet. So go to this chart, if you could, uh, because I think it's pretty difficult to read on the screen. Um, and what you will see down the left-hand side uh, are the series of revenue measures that we showed you last month. Um, and you'll see that each of them has a certain rate uh, or for the fee or the tax. Uh, each of them raises $100 million per annum, again, which is arbitrary, but is a way of showing you uh, how each of them have uh, different uh, yields. And then what we laid out in the colors across uh, the columns are a series of criteria to try to start evaluating these measures against each other. And th there's no pride of authorship in these criteria. There are obviously lots of others you could bring to bear. Uh, but just to explain the ones we used, uh, the first one, no overlap with local taxes. Uh, if somebody's already levying the fee that you're trying to levy, we consider that a downside. Uh, and so if you don't overlap with an existing local tax or fee, that's a good thing in this criteria. If the revenue measure also has a positive policy benefit, uh, for example, the vacant home tax would not only raise money, but it would encourage people to put stock into the marketplace so people can live in it. Uh, that's also considered a good thing. If the revenue source is relatively stable over time and doesn't do a lot of fluctuation, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the rate yield, I would call something like the punching power of each of these measures. And there are some of these measures, like a sales tax, 
that are applied on a very broad base. So the rate that you need to raise a given amount of money is a lot lower than the rate for other things. And in politics, that matters quite a bit, as you all know. Uh, the next one over is administrative ease, uh, especially with some of these new, somewhat more esoteric fees and taxes. Uh, they're going to be tougher to implement and probably more costly uh, to implement. Um, in our field in transportation, we've been levy levying the gas tax for 100 years, so we're really good at it. Um, but when we come up with new measures, they cost a lot more to collect, like tolls. Progressivity we consider a good thing, so uh, revenue measures that are regressive uh, in this criteria don't score as well, and you can see the sales tax is the one that shows up uh, the most, and I'll get back to that. Uh, we don't have any polling results yet, but presumably before we get anywhere near a ballot in the Bay Area, we're going to be doing some polling to figure that out as well. And what we've done in the far right column is just sum them all up uh, and try to figure out uh, an overall score. It's a little hard to see, but the uh, vacant home tax actually is green, uh, which is good. Um, and everybody else is yellow, which uh, you might say doesn't really tell you a whole hell of a lot, um, which is why we came up with another chart. <laughs> so. Uh, yes, and here I am. Uh, and I think this one, to me, is quite revealing, and I hope I'll be able to make it revealing to you. Um, what we did here is we took the rate yield idea and applied it sort of as a stress test to all of these measures. And we didn't use all the measures. We just went with a couple of them just to, to prove the, the, the method. Um, and w the way we stressed these measures is instead of asking them to raise $100 million a year, we want them to raise $800 million, okay? So that's a pretty severe stress. Um, it's also only about half of our bogey. So it's not like we're shooting for the moon here uh, in terms of what we need. Um, and in my own opinion, if we could try to get some kind of $800 million revenue measure or measures on the ballot in 2020 uh, and pass them, that would be a good day's work. Um, so what we've done here again is stress them up to $800 million bucks a year. And what you can see, and I'll just read from left to right, um, under the property owners, uh, a parcel tax that would generate that kind of income would need to be almost $400 per year. Um, measure AA, which we just passed a couple years ago to save the bay, uh, was 12 bucks. So uh, that measure passed by two-thirds. I think passing a $400 per year measure by two-thirds <laughs> is a tall order. Um, you can see the vacant home tax, and here in, in red in, these, in this chart, we showed you some comparisons where we knew they existed, just to do a little bit of ground truthing. Um, Vancouver, where we got this idea of a vacant home tax, their rate is 1%, ours would have to be 8% to raise $800 million. Uh, the developers, my apologies, Stephen, I'm going to keep calling them developers. Um, the developers and the employers, uh, you can again see the rates. Uh, in, in those two categories, and generally they are, in some cases, some, in most cases, well above uh, the rates that they are being charged uh, where their models exist, either here or elsewhere in the country. Uh, the local government one, I, I think, is quite interesting because basically the $800 million stress breaks the machine. Um, they basically would have to give us more than 100% of the money they had, uh, based upon the two different revenue measures that we evaluated to get to 800 million bucks a year. And obviously you can't give people more money than you have. I'll, I guess the Congress can do that, but uh, nobody else can. Um, and then the taxpayers, you can see the, the two measures and uh, the, the sales tax is there. The sales tax needs to be about a half percent to raise uh, 800 million dollars. And I think the very significant finding about the sales tax is that uh, we've got lots of them that have passed by two-thirds votes here in the Bay Area, all the way up and down the state. Um, I would like to return to the question of regressivity because the sales tax is regressive, but here in California, food is exempt, medicine is exempt, 
And I think a part of evaluating the progressivity or regressivity of a revenue measure has to involve what are you spending the results on? What are you spending the money on? And if you're spending it to subsidize a bunch of affordable housing, I would consider that a progressive result, um, even if the measure to get to it might be a little bit regressive. Um, one thing this tells me, uh, this evaluation, is that in terms of providing a big kick of revenue, uh, the, the sales tax has quite a bit of punching power. Um, and it's got quite a bit of practice behind it here in the Bay Area. Um, maybe we don't want to pursue one that, that's that big. Maybe the polling tells us we can't. Uh, but my suggestion would be, I think this shows you the range of motion uh, that we likely have on revenue generation. Um, and if the idea is, as I said uh, earlier, working backwards, um, that we've got one election in 2020 where probably we, we ought to be, in my opinion, pretty aggressive about what we try to pass. We've got another election in 2022, uh, and that election will be lower turnout, probably more conservative, and that might be a place where we do revenue measure number two that, let's say, generates less revenue. Uh, the other detail to mention is that some of these measures, at least, in the developer-employer orbit uh, could be considered fees. And depending upon how the enabling legislation is passed in Sacramento, uh, that legislation could authorize the imposition of those fees directly without a vote of the people. Uh, I have no doubt that would be litigated. Um, we're litigating Regional Measure 3 right now for bridge tolls, so maybe we'll use our precedent to see what we can do in housing. Um, but the fact remains that not all of these require an election, but most of them do. Uh, and so that electioneering part, I think, of our going forward agenda is going to be a very important one. Now let me, uh, at this point, just pass it off to Ken to talk about the housing enterprise, and I'd like to get both ideas on the table before we have a little conversation. And I guess the obvious point to make here is if you're going to be going to the voters or imposing fees directly, you got to give the money to somebody. Uh, and here in the Bay Area, generally speaking, we've been raising money for housing at the municipal or county level. We have not done it at the regional level. So if we're going to start doing it at the regional level, we need some regional institution to manage the money um, and probably to carry out a lot of the other pieces of the CASA agenda that are going to require a lot of implementation and tracking and transparency along the way. So Ken's going to tell you about that. And Ken, I will go backwards and find the right slide. So <clears throat> good morning again, folks. Uh, if your eyes are anything like mine, you probably cannot read that. So I would encourage you to look in your packet on what would be uh, pages four and five if they were numbered. So the, they're close to the front of the packet. Um, and as Steve said, this proposal is essentially about advancing a discussion that's been in the mix all the way through this process that the Bay Area Metro or a regional housing entity or something, someone, should be advancing production, preservation, and protection in a way that we're not able to do in this region at this point in time. And so what we put before you is something, again, as Steve said, that's it's based upon the term sheet framework that you've been using for the other uh, proposals and elements coming out of CASA. Um, but briefly, what the regional housing enterprise would do would be to first raise and distribute revenue. Whatever revenue could be raised uh, that Steve just outlined, this entity would uh, be set up to raise that rev revenue, distribute it, make it available for advancing production of affordable housing, um, protecting residents from displacement, and preserving uh, existing affordable housing as outlined in the compact. It would also create new financing tools and develop partnerships with some of the emerging philanthropic efforts related to housing in the region. Um, it would do something that is a little bit more perfunctory, but we think is really important, and that is to collect and analyze data. All of you are really close to housing in this region, and you know the data is either non-existent or old or not very good. Um, and we would really work to ramp that up and have much more real-time data in terms of where is housing being built, what type of housing, 
Uh, what is the jurisdictional performance relative to new state laws? Um, how would that be monitored and so on? If we're fortunate to have significant funding uh, coming out of the CASA effort, uh, there needs to be a place to hold it. And so as proposed, a regional housing enterprise would have a regional housing trust fund. There's a lot of nuance there. Um, there are some housing trust funds that exist in the region now at the sub-regional level or county level. There would be a need for coordination. Um, there's all sorts of issues related to return to source and so forth that would need to be considered relative to revenue. But we think having a regional housing trust fund uh, that was on some level centralized that could really focus on the three P's that you all have been working so hard on and making sure that funds are being distributed in a way that's equitable and transparent would be helpful. Um, land acquisition uh, is something that has been in many communities for affordable housing and other purposes non-existent since the loss of redevelopment. Uh, there are a lot of small to medium-sized communities in the region that aren't really scaled up to provide the land acquisition um, and compilation of land that's needed to do infill development and other types of housing development, this enterprise could be set up to do that. We currently have technical assistance capabilities uh, at MTC and ABAG related to housing. What is proposed in a regional housing enterprise would build upon that. Um, it would expand upon that based upon many of the ideas that have been discussed here that are likely to be in the CASA Compact and that are described in Enterprises uh, Elephant in the Region report. There's going to be a discussion coming up in November uh, before the MTC Commission at the Commission Workshop related to potential conditioning of transportation funding for housing purposes. This entity could be set up to monitor that and to advance that going forward and to ensure that the movement of housing monies or transportation funding to support housing, that it was aligned with the CASA Compact and that it was impacting all three Ps as outlined in the Compact. RENA, which is always very fun, is coming up again in a few years and this enterprise would be set up to look not only at how RENA advances but how some of the new state laws that tie to RENA or may tie to state law uh, or state laws that may tie to arena in the future, how those are being implemented at the local level and so that we would have alignment there. Um, again, the enterprise would be set up to advance the objectives that are part of the CASA Compact. I think one of the key considerations and one of the key things for you all to think about is how that could be done appropriately and successfully across all three Ps. What would be the appropriate role for this entity um, is it more focused on assisting jurisdictions, financing, um, advancing affordable housing? What is the role related to protection? What is the role related to um, some of the streamlining activities and other activities that are more related to production and removing some of the impediments at the local level? Those are things up for consideration. There's been a lot of discussion uh, at recent meetings and it, I found it encouraging to hear that across uh, just about everybody in the room, I think that one of the primary concerns is that once the compact is approved, is signed off on, is being advanced, that it holds together, that it doesn't get peeled off and there aren't certain components that advance and others that don't advance. And we think that legislative advocacy related to a regional housing enterprise should in part be to do just that, to make sure that the compact remains a compact going forward. Uh, the scale and structure of this is something that needs a lot of discussion. What would the governance of this be? Um, what the size of the table would be? Who would be at the table? That all needs to be uh, considered. There are other models in the country. Uh, probably the most notable is in the Twin Cities where the Metropolitan Council uh, has essentially the types of authority um, in financing uh, and planning capacity that we've outlined here. We've listed a number of the action plans that have been referenced, but when we, when we culled the action plans and looked at where there was some reference to the need to create a thing to advance the action plan, the list was long. We've, we've listed some of them here. And then lastly, in terms of negotiation points, um, I've mentioned a few of them, revenue considerations related to return to source, um, how production reform and streamlining should be incorporated, what is the right mix? Um, oftentimes something that is very heavily regulatory 
does not put itself in a position where it can provide technical assistance very well or be seen as a partnership um, with some of the entities, including local jurisdictions, that it would aim to serve. So what is the right balance there? Um, for example, related to regional inclusionary zoning. Uh, again, how this relates to subregions uh, in cities, this is a big region. Um, the idea is not to create another unproductive, well, I won't say another, to create a, an unproductive bureaucracy, um, <laughs> but something that would actually be successful, uh, like some that already exist. Um, and finally, uh, the Land Assembly Authority would be an entirely new piece. So there is uh, some precedent at MTC related to some of the functions we have here on the transportation side of the house uh, in terms of financing, managing revenue, managing financing. This obviously would be a new realm in terms of housing because as Steve has indicated, uh, we're looking to go from zero to 1.6 billion. So. Uh, there's a lot of room to grow there, but there is experience related to a number of the mechanisms that are outlined in this proposal on the transportation side that we think we could build upon. And Leslie, if I could just make uh, one comment in conclusion and then we can uh, open it up for discussion. Um, and it is relevant to this housing enterprise as we're calling it and its governance. Um, and I, I want to make sure everybody's aware, I think most of you are, uh, that in addition to the staff consolidation of MTC and ABAG, which is now over a year old, uh, the two boards at the time of MTC and ABAG decided to have a governance conversation starting about the middle of next year, um, right in the middle of when we'll be in Sacramento talking about all this stuff. Uh, and I have obviously no way of knowing how that's going to turn out. Um, I will tell you those conversations have occurred in the past and have never quite come home. Um, but that is a conversation that will be occurring, um, and obviously it has relevance to this. Um, in exactly what way, I think we'll have to uh, wait for some uh, events to unfold. Um, the, the second thing I would say is that CASA itself is a public-private partnership. It's an enterprise between those two sectors. And I do believe that it would make some sense to, to try to mimic that in the governance of this new institution. Um, and exactly how you go about doing that, there are any number of ways to figure out. Um, but I, I, I do think one of the great values of CASA is that partnership uh, and the fact that both the public and private sectors bring strengths to the table. Um, and so that's, that's one bit of food for thought. Uh, but we would very much welcome today your comments about some of these negotiation points. Uh, and we will have to put some meat on the bones as we go. Um, and then also, just to remind you, we've given you uh, some additional depth, I think, on the revenue conversation today. Uh, so to the extent you want to engage on that one, too, we're all ears. Did you, Steve, did you want to start with the revenue side, or, or what do you think? Uh, you know, they really are, in my opinion, Together. fairly related, okay. so I, I, I wouldn't mind a, a joint conversation. Okay, well, well, let's open it up to conversation. Uh, if you could just put your cards up if you want to speak. Tamika? Um, thank you, Ken and Steve. This is super helpful, and it's nice to sort of reflect back a summary of what we've been talking about in this, particularly on the enterprise piece. So I just want to amplify a couple of the negotiation points that I think we need to consider, um, which is a highly regulatory environment will make this not helpful. So I just want to amplify that that is really important to the design of this enterprise, as well as um, I think that we aren't great at being nimble in our bureaucracies. And so to the extent that we can evaluate this um, structure with the like lowest tech way possible, like legally feasible, but super accessible. <laughs> um, because I feel like it, if, we, if we don't have the same sort of visionary approach to the design of this enterprise, we'll get the same result of it being highly inaccessible to showing real results on the ground and in, in communities. So I just want to amplify that I think those two pieces really need attention. And lots of folks smarter than I can help think about 
the examples either nationally or otherwise that are like, okay, how do we have the dexterity that we need to allow the, the um, sort of com capacity of this enterprise to directly impact the um, elements of the compact? So I just am advocating for less is more and how do we create a structure that allows us the fluidity that we need to keep the things linked together. Um, and then on the revenue side, uh, it's illuminating um, that, you know, the jump between where you need the 800 million to be is pretty terrifying. Um, I would just say we still need the money. So we, we should think about how to be creative about phasing either election cycles or whatever, but I don't want us to be intimidated by the fact that these jumps in the fees or taxes are so significant because I want us to still keep our eye on the scale of the problem. Linda? So I just want to echo what Tamika is saying because we already are subject to quite a bit of bureaucracy in the world of building housing right now. So to the extent that we can do something that isn't uh, creating yet a third set of things we have to do, I, I would echo that. Um, I would point you to Massachusetts on the land side. They have a quasi-public organization that really does deal with land disposition. And so to the extent that this entity can both buy land but be the recipient of big public pieces of land, uh, I think that would be a really good thing uh, and would add benefit to the region. Um, and then lastly, on the on the revenue sources, uh, I, I just have a question about the redevelopment stuff. I, I think that's not immediately going to happen. And I don't, it doesn't seem like it's really on the list, but there is existing money that was intentionally set aside for affordable housing before it got swept. And so is that on the list of potential revenue options, you know, could we go after some of the 20% that's that just evaporated? Um, so it's just a question, Leslie, whether or... Yeah, no, I, I absolutely think we're going to look at, at all of those things, and there are other things that were left over with redevelopment, including inclusionary requirements and uh, replacement housing obligations, things like that we need to look at, as well as the, the former 20%. And then I just have one comment. To the extent that this generates real net new revenue, I think the acceptance will be a lot higher. And so if it's something that we're all doing to create more regulatory framework, I don't think we will do as well politically as if we're generating a billion plus dollars a year for mon in money for housing. Amy? Yes, I wanted to ask a couple questions on the rate yield stress test. And could you go, this is super helpful and um, puts things into concrete terms so we can actually talk about them, weigh them, evaluate. So this is really terrific. Um, the first question that I have is about the gross receipts tax because I see that um, San Francisco and Oakland tax rates potentially go almost up to or beyond that rate. So can you talk about some of those comparisons around the gross receipts tax? Um, I realize there's broader uh, challenges about getting those passed and getting employers support for those kinds of things. But just in terms of looking at the rates and how they um, compare, I also uh, had a question. Could you talk more about the, the general obligation bonds um, and, and just go through your analysis of that um, bucket a little bit more in because that has been the primary local revenue tool that we've used at the ballot in, in, in San Francisco historically, but also in 2016 and now this year in 2018. And um, it, it would be good to get a sense of uh, the scale around that. And our, um, are, th are these, is, is what's here the ones backed by property taxes or more backed by uh, regional or state debt? Can you uh, go into that? Yeah, and Amy, I appreciate your highlighting the fact that the gross receipts tax is probably the exception that proves the rule, right? It's, it's, it's one of the few on this chart where the existing models are not like way, 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 way lower. Um, than what we're talking about. Even so, at the top of the San Francisco rate, you know, it would basically be a doubling. Um, and how the individual businesses are stratified between those rates, I think we'll have to get back to you on that information. Um, on bond debt, uh, you know, that's a tough one. Um, you know, GO bonds are issued by units of general government that have general obligation revenue, who have general revenue. 
Um, and this new entity doesn't have any general revenue until it's given some or raises some. Uh, so I, I think that one in particular is, at least at a conceptual level, very hard to translate, I think, at a regional scale. And so the fact that you've been raising the money through geo bonds issued by counties, um, that, that's, that's who basically has the ability to do that in addition to the state. Um, so I, I think it would be a difficult one to figure out just the, the sort of geopolitics of it, number one. I think number two, uh, the trouble with bonds is you got to keep doing them, right? And look, that's not a fatal flaw, uh, but it, it does require a string of victories uh, instead of just maybe one every 20 years, you got to do it every five. So that's just the trade-off, I think. Just a quick follow-up question, if, if I may. So this bucket here, are you assuming this is backed by property taxes similar to the municipal and county bonds, or are you thinking a different structure more like? It, it's hard to say. You don't know. Because, okay. you know, I, I can't imagine many cities or counties wanting to surrender their property tax revenue to a new regional institution. So in all likelihood, the regional agency would need it, you could do it, I suppose, by joint powers agreement um, if you want to span county boundaries. Uh, but I, I, again, I just think this one, we've, we, we put this down on the page because it's an obvious thing to think about, uh, but trying to translate it into a regional uh, environment has just been really difficult for us. Abby? Sorry, Abby. Thanks. I, I just first have to say this revenue exercise is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in terms of analysis. Like, this is so cool to be going through this process. Um, I, I really wanted to focus yeah, on... Yeah, if only it generated revenue, right? It'd be well, great. Well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Can we sell it or something? Oh, yeah. Anyway. Um, on the regional housing entity, I, I mean, obviously, um, I'm in strong support of this. It was part of our proposal for the public land um, uh, strategy. Um, I would ask um, for consideration of adding something about data collection for the homeless population um, and doing that collection at the regional scale. I think, you know, if San Francisco is net neutral in their homeless counts, but Alameda County increases by 40 percent, nobody's won. So we really do have to start tracking that information at the regional scale, and I think this entity is a good, it obviously it's very fitting um, with that. Um, and I would just, um, also just enforce as, a, as an entity that owns property um, across multiple counties and is trying to develop that property. You know, we, 40% of our properties in Contra Costa County, um, we're running into constant struggles because there is no, no local source there. Um, obviously that's an issue many people there are working on. But um, I did just want to emphasize the importance of being helping us to prioritize our portfolio across multiple counties. And I'm sure that's echoed with a lot of other, other folks. So just strong support here. Janice? Um, just a quick question to clarify under the Manage a Reason Regional Housing Trust Fund. Is the idea there to coalesce all the current uh, housing trusts or to do something brand new? And if it's brand new and autonomous from, how do they intersect or do they? I think that's one of the key considerations is what the relationship would be. And I, I don't think at this point we have a fixed idea of what exactly that looks like, but we'd want to, you know, work together uh, with with the partners, with the existing uh, trust funds that are there, and make sure that you know we have a do no harm approach. We're not trying to undo good things in the region. We're trying to be really additive. So what exactly that looks like is something we'd have to figure out. You know, maybe just to put an additional piece of flavoring on that. Um, Obviously, one of the advantages of having a trust fund, say, in County X, is that the money is going to stay in County X, and the people in County X sort of like that. Um, if you're going to do something that's multi-county or regional, I think you're going to need a fairly high return to source uh, guarantee to buy people into a regional approach. I, 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 look, that's something MTC has been doing for our whole existence. That's what we do is figure out where the balancing point is between local guarantee and prerogative and regional discretion and competition. Um, and you try to talk people into something that's not 100% and 0%. Uh, and I think that would be the trick here. 
I, I think I would also add that we're going to be having more conversations on the regional entity, and I think the vehicle for how the funds are collected and distributed, uh, maybe the use of the word housing trust is not right right now. I think the, the issue is how will the funds that are collected be distributed? So I do think that it, it raises a concern about these other entities that are not just county, that are already working regionally, um, I, and how this um, this works with them. So good point and something we need to work through. Um, Derica? Thanks, Leslie. Um, quick question on the, the head tax. What um, threshold for, jo for jobs, number of jobs was it? Um, did it include all jobs in the Bay Area, or did it include employers with 100 jobs or more? I'm looking at Vikran. I thought we... Did we key it at 100? Uh, so the uh, on this chart, at least, it's for all jobs. OK. Every job. So mom and pop jobs, too. Right, for the calculation for now. The, the, wah, wah. OK. Just so, <laughs> just uh, not to lose it, though, we, we did have another idea that was a little bit more complicated that was keyed off 100 uh, okay. or greater. So look, that's, that's obviously a variable yeah. that you can set wherever you want. I just liked the 800. Right. Million. Number. Um, uh, the second couple of points have been made. The, the, the other points have been made. Uh, governance super matters around this, obviously, so I don't have much more to add except to really think about the process for that governance discussion and how it happens in a public way and with key constituencies that won't be at the table unless they're invited. Um, and then, Steve, you made my point too, just that sales tax, for example, I know um, it's attractive, and I do, I do actually agree with you that a progressive expenditure plan can be a carrot in a regressive tax. Um, but counties, you know, use this for public health, and cities and transit agencies use sales tax, and so there are co there's competition for sales tax with locals that, that is, makes this complicated and return to source is important, but also like folks are lining up their sales taxes for 2020 and 2022 um, as well, so complicated. Well, and, and that gives me an opportunity to raise uh, a subject that I, I think some of you may have worked on uh, for a bit of time in the last few years, uh, at least in the infrastructure community, I'll call them. Uh, there has been talk about some kind of mega measure. Um, and we've got some mega things out there in infrastructure that we'd like to pay for, like a new BART tube, as an example. Um, and if, in fact, that measure is a live item around the 2020 election, and if we are, is there some scenario where we might join forces and help each other? It's also conceivable we could hurt each other. Um, and I, I, so I, I would encourage you to think more broadly than just the housing topic uh, about whether there are any partners that might involve a better chance of success for both instead of going head to head um, in a grudge match. Adi. Hi, thank you. I uh, just wanted to highlight a few of the sensitivities that I'm tracking on this. Um, one also has to do with the, um, the, head, the head tax. And I'm trying to think through cities like San Francisco, which transition from payroll tax to gross receipts under the kind of broad agreement that, you know, hey, one will go down, the other goes up, will now be also hit by a payroll tax. Um, I don't know how many other cities like that there are in the region, but there are none. Um, but that'll have, that'll have an impact on kind of the sensitivities of all those negotiations that went on in the city. Um, I don't know, potentially, I guess, if you think it through, a desire to go to a lower tax region which doesn't have both, uh, another city that doesn't have both forms of taxes, but rather just one. That's the first point. Second is to support the concerns about um, kind of the regulatory stuff that Linda spoke about earlier. If I were a staff member at this regulatory, at this housing agency, and I was doling out $10 million, I would want to control you know, who's living in there, what the project looks like, um, irrespective of the fact that tax credit entity and the city of whatever also wants to control that. Um, so how to both empower an agency with money but also not um, have yet another party um, telling you what a housing development should look like. Three is on the uses side. I appreciate the emphasis on data. Um, people are going to be paying out, whether you're a company or a person, you're going to feel some pain and you do want to see results. 
Um, so there's always a concern, and my friends on the labor side feel this as well, that if cost of constructions or uh, cost of construction really balloons or um, acquisition value really increases for whatever reason, um, massive job growth, there's a bit of a stimulus right here that's being created. So we actually don't produce a lot. Um, we should know that because there's a lot of money going to fewer things. Um, and so I appreciate that emphasis on data. And then I also want to highlight the, the redevelopment revenue set aside, um, a, a challenge with that as well. And, and I know that um, Chu's office is, is battling this dynamic is that the, you know, the base year is going to be the, the problem and it's going to take a little while for everything to accrue. And so that as an idea will be one that is going to be one that takes a long time to actually see real money come out of. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'll close there. Uh, Jennifer. Thanks, um, and sorry I've been a little absent the last couple months, um, uh, but I've been watching. Um, so um, great progress, um, and I'm going to hit the same two themes I normally hit. Um, one is our biggest uh, gap in housing is the missing middle, and so I'm not clear how this revenue stream uh, addresses that, um, and uh, I think it's very easy to continue to ignore the missing middle because they tend not to have the resources or presence to participate in events like this. And so I'd like to just really hit hard on what is the goal, if any, to address the missing middle in a funding program like this. And then second, I wanted to um, echo uh, the prior comment uh, and, and again, sort of use some out-of-region uh, examples. Um, LA has raised a ton of money in two bond measures, and they're having a huge problem actually spending it because of regulatory barriers. And San Francisco, of course, which also has a fair amount of money in the city itself, um, is experiencing, you know, price per unit costs that are simply uh, astronomical. And so creating more money without actually getting it into production at a much lower per unit cost to me is um, a little bit, uh, you know, throwing bad money after or good money after bad. Um, um, and on that same point, uh, because labor is so important and solving our labor uh, challenges are so important and achieving wage equity is so important, uh, and accepting money comes with then a, a prevailing wage requirement, typically. If this is just intended to sort of pay for the prevailing wage um, uh, gap, um, then we should probably just say that. And I think it's actually maybe in s some circumstances a pretty good trade. Uh, but if it's short of that, so that you get a little bit of money and then your project costs that much more, um, and you're still in the hole, I think it's, it's again, a counterproductive measure to offer up, um, you know, public dollars uh, in a way that just makes it uh, more costly to build housing. Um, so, um, you know, if this is a trade for prevailing wage, I think there's merit to that. If it's not, then I think it's going to be counterproductive. Matt? Uh, a, f a few quick thoughts just to to complicate the discussion we were just having about the um, the benefits of having a, a regional entity that is not focused on regulatory issues. Um, it, it it makes me think about um, how important the the conditioning and leveraging actions have been that MTC has taken on housing, getting all of the housing uh, every jurisdiction to have a, a housing element that's up to uh, up to up to date, um, and that. If we're creating a housing entity with that specialization in understanding all of the intricacies of regional housing, it it might be a bit odd to leave the 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 leveraging, the regulatory, the the conditioning um, powers and functions entirely to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And so, thinking about how how we can best intersect those two issues so that we're that we're leveraging the expertise where we have it and the dollars where we have it um, will be will be important. Um, a, a second thought is that I, I hope as we're 
moving forward with all of this with our three p framework that we're also being explicit about a three e goal that we're able to articulate that to the public as well so that they they understand that we're getting benefits for the environment for social equity for the economy and what we propose here and then lastly with all of these buckets I think you might have touched on this last time with the with a 2020 election that seems so key and 2022 being infinitely far away into the future how much of this could be wrapped into a single measure that goes to the voters and I ask that in part because we've been we've been talking about ways to keep the whole compact together and if we've got a ballot that's got ten different measures to weigh in on that could dilute some of that power well and and one way I would try to answer that Matt is to look at the blue boxes here right and I know we've talked about a a you know joint accountability model here where everybody is going to take a piece of the solution um, and I, I doubt that you could put five of these suckers on the same ballot and expect to pass any one of them uh, so I think number one we're going to have to be selective number two as I said earlier some of these may not require voter approval and that's indeed helpful if that's true um, thirdly the redevelopment conversation uh, you know uh, that's a state legislative piece of business that's going to be statewide it's not going to be Bay Area specific and so that's going to be another way of generating some revenue um, that doesn't have to go through the voters so I, I think we we do need to keep the framework of trying to have everybody contribute to the solution we just don't want them all on the same ballot at the same time and to the extent that the legislature can chip in, to the extent that a fee approach can chip in, I think that's all to the good. Um, the, the other point I would make, and it's a bit of a response to Jennifer's uh, point, is that at least we don't understand our charge in terms of raising revenue to just be raising revenue for affordable housing production. Um, you know that's one of the P's but it's not you know there are the other P's as well and our understanding is that the protection P has revenue requirements the preservation P has revenue requirements uh, some of the other strategies about capping fees for local development um, will probably have some kind of backfill uh, revenue requirement so uh, I, I think we showed you in fact a, a proposal about how you might cut up the revenue at your last meeting and we probably should have included it in this meeting because I think that's another thing we've got to hash out is however much money we raise who gets how much of it for what purpose I think is still an open question as you raise okay Amy and then if anyone else has a burning question put up your card because we'll we'll move into the next conversation uh, two comments or comment and question the first is is that we did pass legislation and some uh, refinements to that legislation for affordable housing authorities which is redevelopment like that can be formed by local jurisdictions now um, and can based on uh, both sales tax and property tax uh, be can generate revenue without going to the voters so it's a tool that we definitely should look at because it's active and possible and we because it's still new uh, legislation Michael Lane over there is the expert it's his it's his legislation we're still figuring out how to make it work in local communities but I think it's a good way to start looking at it redevelopment is a much is sort of everybody wants a piece of redevelopment and uh, I think it's going to be a lot more arduous of a process to figure out although well really critical to do it um, the second the, the um, question that I have is um, is have you thought about or is there a way to look at again maybe these are sort of a series of unlikely scenarios that we're considering but in the event that we can pass uh, prop 13 reform and split roll with 11.5 billion dollars coming back to local jurisdictions if that gets passed in 2020 which we're 100 percent behind that and hope that it does and we'll do everything to get it passed is there some way to capture dollars before they hit general funds to have a set aside and create a programming and it, what would it take to do that um, and that could be a huge battle but 
is is there have you looked into those avenues to capture money before it hits the general fund budget well uh, Amy one thing I would say just based on my experience I think that measure qualified for the ballot yesterday and so my guess is it's already fully committed uh, today um, <laughs> that's just the way the world works I it, look I think that would be a battle um, but I, I, I think the the, the the underlying point I would make is that this is a moving target. And uh, we are not sitting here today to try to discourage anybody uh, from making headway on this agenda, uh, however they see fit to do it. Um, and to the extent that we make more progress on redevelopment in Sacramento than we think, then maybe that helps the rest of this agenda go down a little bit easier as well. Uh, so I, I just think we need to remain flexible and remain cognizant of events as they unfold. Okay, so with that, um, I think, uh, Jennifer, did you want to introduce the next portion? We also have lunch, so you can let us know what to do with lunch. Okay, um, yeah, we're going to have a little bit of a uh, game plan change. Um, so we're actually, the moderators think it would be best to uh, really present these and have everybody be able to hear all the comments. So we're going to divide uh, the next hour and 15 minutes into hearing two different sets. And then my suggestion um, is since we're not going to break out in groups and not have the public participate, we might want to have another public comment period. So we would do about 30 minutes on this first set, and I'm going to write them up on the wall, and Jennifer's going to facilitate, and Denise is going to take notes. And the first set of term sheets is going to be the rent cap, the right to counsel, no net loss, public land, and liability. And the second set, using my highly sophisticated technology here on my phone, is going to be ADUs, density bonus, and inclusionary, um, Process, Denise, what is that? Um, uh, what's the process one, Denise? Number 12, Number 12 uh, SB 35 and 827. Um, oh, so I see. I have the numbers. So the first, the first ones are term sheets 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, and 16. And the second one is 10, 11, 12, 14, and 15. Um, Denise, you're going to put those up, those groupings up. And... Um, Denise and Jennifer Martinez are going to trade off, but they're going to briefly introduce uh, each one and then facilitate a dialogue. Um, so Wally, Jennifer can we get the uh, microphone for Jennifer? I think, Jennifer, you ought to stand up. Yeah. Let me just make... Okay, so we went back and forth a lot on how to organize this conversation. And um, I'm sure there are many things that are going to go wrong about the conversation <laughs> we're going to have right now. So just... Prepare yourself for that, um, but it would have gone the other. It would have gone wrong anyway. So, uh, so I'm going to make a recommendation that we actually take five to ten minutes, let people get some lunch, let you review the term sheets because some of them came out a little later than expected. So you might not have gotten a chance to look at them. And the question we're going to be asking you is, are we in the ballpark? So we've been kind of like painting a box. The box was really, really big when we started. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Now we're kind of looking at like, you know, the diamond of a baseball field kind of measurement. Are we getting closer to that space? How are we painting that diamond together? We're not going to necessarily hit a home run right now. So we're not looking to you for you to paint the box of the plate. I'm not a sports person. You, you guys are laughing at me, right? But like, like the home plate, that's not how small we need the box to be. We need the box to be smaller than the whole field, bigger than the home plate, OK? So help us paint that box today. And then we're going to get into more process of how we get closer and closer together so that box becomes really manageable. Okay? All right. So so think about that. Get yourself some food, process, and we'll come back. Uh, so 
We are going to, I'm going to repeat the, the numbers again for this first section. We know it's a lot. Um, this is not the only opportunity for you to give input or be part of a conversation. Um, this is one intervention point. There are opportunities for you to offer more detail on specifics online uh, by calling any of the work group moderators. I'm going to throw the co-chairs in that too. Call them too. Uh, but there are other ways of giving input and, and the one-to-one -one conversations and then we're going to discuss ongoing process at the end of today's meeting. So don't think you have to say it all now. Help us paint the box, okay? All right, so we're going to discuss first two, three, I'm sorry, let me slow down. Two, three, four, five, seven, and 16. And um, you don't need to hear me talking. We need to hear you talking. So um, unless you feel very strongly that you want me to go through what is already written down in these little sheets, um, I think what we're going to do is open it up for conversation um, and start to get your input on some of these things. So uh, Jennifer, okay. could, I, could I just also just share that the MTC staff is oh yes please okay. sorry I missed that part. so I just wanted to share that uh, a number of the MTC staff from the neighborhoods and housing team are here and they've done some research into these elements on places where we've needed more information so um, as the questions come up uh, if they have the answers we're gonna invite them to share and um, so uh, and they may ask a few questions as well Okay, we're gonna start with open comment on any of these proposals wherever, wherever somebody would like to begin. While you guys are thinking, I just wanted to answer Steve Levy's question. The notion was that the rent cap would apply to all rental units, whether they're in a house or a multifamily building. So they're, at least until we change it. That's how it's written right now. Well. What do you mean on down? Our affordable housing already has a. Okay, good question. Good comment. Affordable should be carved out. Affordable should what? Who said? There should be an exemption for something that has a regulatory agreement on it. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's kind of was our assumption to begin with. If it already has a regulatory... Then that's what supersedes. On okay. AMI. Yeah, it's already... A... So this would apply to anything without any kind of a restriction. That's right. So your, your high-end uh, rentals, everything. That's right. That's how it's currently written. Okay. I, I think we, we might want to look into that. Um, because sometimes even affordable housing developers try to raise rents and, and we sometimes get 12% ask and so we might want to look at that. Okay, great. We're starting our rent cap. And you can also say, wow, you're getting really close. This is almost a home run. Second base, at least. So it's a double. <laughs> this is going to go bad. OK, anyone? Others? Yeah. Um, to get to second base with this one, um, uh, the, um, the provisions around what else comes along with a statewide emergency declaration, I think, is something that we need to be very careful about. It's mentioned it here as other streamlined provisions that might come along with that. Um, I think that's, there's a positive version of that and there's a negative version of that. Um, I would hate for us to move forward with, with um, something that, that establishes these rent caps and overturns important um, planning provisions that exist across the state. So I think all we intended was that the rent cap would operate. We were not intending to call into play a host of unnamed provisions. Does that answer the question? 
<laughs> Can you just shed a little more light about the um, vacancy deed control cap applies to rent or not unit? Does that mean a registry gets created? I'm just trying to understand how what the thought process behind that. Yeah. So this one, um, the question is, does this uh, does this continue on with the vacancy control, vacancy deed control? Uh, you know, the current setup is that it's a vacancy deed control. So when someone leaves the unit, the unit can go to market rate. Um, and then it then a, a new cap is introduced once a new person is in the unit. Um, so it's part of the conversation we've not yet had. Um, and so that's why it's listed under other area for further negotiation. Um, do you have a comment on that in terms of what it should or shouldn't do? Okay, great. Well, I was listening to the KQED forum program on my ride in today, uh, where the debate on Costa Hawkins was happening. It was quite interesting. And Guy Maserati noted that if Costa Hawkins gets repealed, then vacancy control could reign supreme. So, would this legislation preempt that? It's just a question that I think we need to have some clarity on. So this is not designed to preempt um, local jurisdictions that might apply a different approach to uh, rent cap or rent control. Um, and I just want to remind you all that Prop 10 only allows local jurisdictions to make a choice of that kind. It will not necessarily automatically do it that way because local jurisdictions would still have to decide for themselves how they would want to approach it. So Prop 10 does nothing but allow jurisdictions to make choices that they, that they currently do not have the ability to do. This, wouldn't, this is not intended to try to preempt that sort of local conversation. Jennifer, excuse, excuse me, uh, it's Ken over here, hi. Um, folks in the audience are saying that when committee members are speaking, they're having difficulty hearing uh, your comments, so if you could just be sure to speak up. Other comments or questions or things we need to do more investigation about on the rent cap? Josh. Well, I could take an hour and probably give I'm everyone sure a yeah. full um, outline of the Apartment Association's concerns. Um, to your comment earlier, I think this is probably still in the dugout and not yet up for bat. Um, you know, first of all, anyway. in my view, yes, that's what yes. we're talking about. Um, I think that anything that seeks to undermine Costa Hawkins is going to be met with significant opposition in Sacramento. So assuming this gets to Sacramento, there's going to be a huge hurdle just to have this conversation in the legislature. Um, I think what's unclear here is what is an emergency under this parameter? Is it a natural disaster? Is it the vacancy rate being below a certain threshold? I don't know. I think what's also important to understand is whether or not this would be means tested and only available to households with who make below 100% of AMI. Um, and how would it be enforced? Right now, um, every city with rent control spends millions of dollars a year to monitor and enforce their rent control program. Collectively, the state locals spend over $60 million to enforce rent control in the various jurisdictions that have rent control. If there's going to be a regional-wide rent control, who's monitoring it? Who's enforcing it? Who's paying for it? Um, those are some questions that need to come up as well. Um, so I'll s stop there. And Caitlin. Um, just in reaction to that, I think I would advocate pretty strongly for there not to be means tested, just because I think that opens the floodgates for exclusion. Um, I think we're seeing that a lot with Section 8 right now, and I think it's while it would be great to have this more targeted, I think it just opens us up to have landlords um, reject people because they, they know that they'll be facing a rent cap. So I just want to that in. Comments? Uh, Derica and then Mary. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I certainly agree with Caitlin. Um, I think we're like, you know, up to bat, not in the dugout. Um, no, I, of course I support this. I just, uh, I want to make a comment just about how we got here to emergency rent cap. Um, some of us think it's kind of funny that the anti-gouging language got taken out as like a, like, like being mean to landlords, because it wasn't, I don't think, the tenant advocates who called it anti-gouging originally, by the way. Um, 
we actually want rent stabilization and rent control, and that got voted down. It, it was voted as less popular among this group, and then anti-gouging became a hook. So I just want to set that straight. And just say that part of the analysis was that, of this group, I believe, was that gouging very high increases in rent that were destabilizing communities and, and leading to gentrification and displacement is something that in a housing crisis, we should do something about. Different than rent control, different than a rent cap, actually. So to that end, I think we are in the ballpark here. What we're talking about is a, a, a limit in this emergency situation, in this housing crisis, that will help contribute to an anti-identification and displacement crisis. So um, I think it is, I think we're close. I think there's a lot to be talked about around, as, as is listed here in the areas of negotiation, around banking and around percentages and what is to, what is gouging. I mean, right? Um, we're not after the good guys here. We're after making sure that communities can be stabilized um, in a crisis. So go team. <laughs> Mary. Um, and speak closer to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Got it. Thank you. Just one, just one minor point with regards to obviously the, you know, how you analyze um, what's gouging and what the caps are. But uh, using age of unit for cap, I think is uh, dysfunctional. It's uh, because you can have a very high quality unit that's old and very well maintained and was well built and designed to start with. So we need a better system for measuring quality. Don't ask me what it is. Maybe it's like a. Airbnb software that people rate apartments or something that's not terribly bureaucratic, but that would be effective. And actually, that'd be great because it would incentivize the landlords to do a better job. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm not sure how often I'm supposed to contribute to this, but I have a question that will help maybe set a, a, a framework. Is anybody in the room who's engaged in this process not, and put your hand up, think we're in a housing crisis in Northern California? This is pornography, right? Everybody knows it when they, we're in a housing crisis. Anybody not think we're in a housing crisis? I'm gonna get that out of the way. Everybody? Okay, so let's not talk about whether we're in it. Let's talk about how to get out of it. So I just wanna get, make. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I'm gonna try to shift us because I know we have limited time on this. So Linda, uh, on. I just wanna go back to why we started with gouging. This is really based in California usury law we were looking to a different way to frame this argument, and we were looking to declaring a state of emergency and declaring a why, setting a frame around what the parameters are for the emergency to be declared, because I think if we do this for the Bay Area, Orange County's gonna wanna do it, and other places are gonna wanna do it, and so I think the what constitutes the emergency, what the sunset looks like, I think all of that is gonna be hugely important for us to give some thought to, and, and the reason we started with gouging wasn't because it was what the tenants wanted, it's because that's really what's happening in the Sonoma County invoking after the fires. And so it's a different place in the law. It wasn't the Costa Hawkins place, which we, we actually felt was semantically more than a little bit important to think about. Yeah. Jonathan. And just, yeah, real, <clears throat> just real quickly, I think in my head, I can kind of get my head around the whole uh, anti-gouging issue. I think the vacancy decontrol is a separate issue, which is why I kind of asked the question. And if the, if the concern is, uh, to Caitlin's point, about means testing, the you know the decontrol attached to the renter and not the unit is kind of connotes mean testing. So we just should be careful about how those two interact. Thank you. All right, we're going to move forward again. There are other ways to contribute to this conversation through with more details if you have them, or question marks if you have them. Um, we're going to move to any of the. Let's go, just go to right to council. Quickly on any, well, not quickly, but in a timely way, right to council. Heather's nodding. What is that nod? Uh, Jennifer. I'm not sure I'm allowed to speak. I'm just oh, nodding okay, like, nodding. yes, okay, there sorry. should be no. <laughs> Tamika. Um, <clears throat> this one actually is in the ballpark. It's second, third base. I think it's really important. Um, I was just gonna say to this one and maybe even some of the other elements, um, attaching sort of the data about how many folks are impacted, I think gives us some perspective about um, 
the scale of the problem and what this solution will actually help us fix. So to, to Linda's point about, you know, Sonoma in, uh, as an example for the rent cap, it'd be helpful for us to be able to have vocabulary around communities or what is the data telling us about where these policy implementations would be most successful and what the scale of impact is. And I think Right to Council and all of these have that element that I'm looking to link the data to the scale of impact. Uh, but so many thumbs up on Right to Council, super important, particularly to as a prevention strategy to moving more of folks uh, into homelessness who are, who are vulnerable around housing insecurity. Thank you. Other comments on Right to Council? Oh, Caitlin. Um, this one to me, I agree. I, I'm a big fan of this one. I just will lob in that this to me is one that needs to exist with the rest of the compact because I think without the rent cap and without just cause, which I know we're not talking about today, this is not as meaningful. So I'm just going to throw that out there that I love this, but I like it more in combination with others. So that's what would make it a home run. Okay. <laughs> I love, I'm glad this baseball thing is going. Josh. So I think that, again, I'll go back to means testing. Uh, you bring it up in your term sheet. This should be only available to those who cannot afford an attorney. There's no reason we should be providing government-funded attorneys to people who make $300,000 a year. Um, <laughs> I know the trial lawyers would love it, but um, there's also needs to be some sort of a look at a cap on fees because there's some studies that have been done that says it takes an average of 55 hours per case, at an average of $250 per hour for a lawyer, which I would assume is relatively inexpensive. Um, we're looking at $13,750 per case. And we need to make sure there's some sort of cost control measures in there so that the tenants or the tenant right lawyers are not using this as an opportunity to gain as much income as they can in legal fees. Um, there also needs to be some way to ensure that there's not a mechanism for then the lawyer representing the tenant to then go to the property owner and try to recover their attorney's fees. So there needs to be some caps and guardrails on attorney fee and recovery of attorney's fees. I'm glad you bring this up because um, I think a clarifying point on this is important that this was conceived of as being a, a way by which organizations like legal aid type of legal organizations <coughs> would be resourced to provide these um, these, this legal assistance. Um, I have had that conversation with a couple of attorneys to kind of ver understand how that works. They're, uh, they're a salaried, they're, they're not a by case, so actually creates incentive to move things at a quicker clip. Um, if they have contracts that require a certain number of clients, et cetera, et cetera, and their actual salaries are, aren't tied to duration of a court case, for example. So it's not an hourly rate. <coughs> Um, so it uh, kind of by its nature creates that kind of limited um, ballooning well, effect. Well, they, may be, ballooning they effect. may be salaried, but nothing stops them from tracking their hours and then going to the prevailing, to the losing party and saying, we bill at 250 an hour, we put 90 hours into this case. Let's put that in there, Josh. Uh, well, and for consideration, okay. for conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, Abby. Yeah, I just want to, on the on the point of the income cap, note that um, many tenants do not qualify for legal aid and are uh, do not thus receive representation right now. So, the income cap would absolutely have to be higher than what it is right now for legal aid. Okay, great. Other comments on this? Okay. Uh, housing element in Rena. So glad Denise is taking notes on this one. Number four in your, Linda. So I, you know, I, I have been a proponent of this, but have been asked by many people outside of this room, am I out of my mind? We've never had teeth in housing element. We should just take it off the list altogether, stop wasting our time and winnow, winnow down the list to other stuff since the state has added many, many pieces of teeth to the housing element recently. Um, 
some of which may or may not work in court, but that I'm tilting at windmills, so I submit to you that I might stand completely corrected on whether or not this should even be on the list. Wait, wait, wait. Back up to that. So you may be considering that this should not be on the list? Is yep. that what you just said? That is the question I'm asking is, is it worth it for us to go after housing element law yet again? Uh, when we have gone after it now for three straight years, we now have a bunch of new laws that are on the books as of last year that have not yet been tested in court. Some of them I have personally tested in court and they've stood up pretty well, but that going after housing element law may not really get us all that much bang for our buck in this effort. And since we're trying to get focused, maybe we should not bother. Just right. a comment. Can I ask a question to that, Linda? You see this as reform or uh, as, a, I mean, a lot of it is is just requirements of what jurisdictions <coughs> should do. It's not as much teeth as, as it is maybe gums. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, well, I mean, I guess the question for me for CASA, and, and you know, and it was really a conversation with someone who writes housing elements for virtually every city in the state uh, who said to me, well, Linda, you know, it's all well and good for you to add more stuff to the list, but do you think you're really going to get anything out of this? Um, and it really, you know, and, and this was because we've all been out talking to people about what do you think about these proposals. And, and you know, I, I think that there is some value to saying to the cities you have to do certain things in your housing element, but if we have a huge legislative list and a heavy lift for next year, is this something we want to add to the to the list. And so I would just tell you that, you know, I may be converting my thinking on this. Um, and, and so I'm just putting that out because Denise and I got done with this conversation and we emailed each other like, well, maybe we should just take it off the list uh, for this group. So. Okay. I think that's important to, to remember. So I think one of, correct me, co-chairs, if I'm wrong about this, but one of the ways we've approached this has been that there are kind of some big ticket items we want to move forward that is going to take all of us doing it together um, and knitting together those proposals to make it happen. And then there's other things that we think are really great ideas that maybe others can take on or others individually in this room will take on and we may have more of a recommendation kind of approach to it but not a big political lift for it. So that might be something we think about. Any other comments on this one? Is there somebody else who wants to join the church and be baptized today and take something off the list? <laughs> take something off the list. Fred's like, please take something off the list. That's like a cry of desperation, folks. Help him out. Help a guy out. Okay. Anyone else? Jennifer saying yes. I vote with Linda. I, vote I, with Linda. I was on the same conversation as Linda where we tried three different ways to convince this lawyer that you could actually put teeth in the housing element. And we were met with, no, nope, no, nope, that's not going to work. No, nope, it's not going to make any difference. No, nope, if I were you, I would do something else. By a guy whose job for 30 years has been writing and enforcing housing elements. And the conclusion so, was there's never been an effective enforcement action against any city <laughs> who didn't have a housing element or who had an inadequate housing element or who wasn't implementing the housing element they had that has ever resulted in any change in housing production. Or any so, city being so decertified for its housing element. I mean, it was just, I, frankly, it was kind of depressing. Uh, so. Okay, Jennifer wants to get in here. So it is so uncomfortable for me to be optimistic in this crowd. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you, um, uh, but like 95% plus of the projects in our shop, and we've got, what, 18 lawyers doing this work, are infill projects, and fully half of those now we are using one or more of these legal tools effectively, mm. effectively. And I have great confidence in our um, HCD uh, leadership um, beefing up and in our AG staff beefing up. I don't think there's much tolerance for the basic story, which is cities who claim they're going to approve housing and then don't. Everybody's irritated with that. So for CASA to not say, we want that to be better, seems like inconceivable to me. Okay, so and get better lawyers, can you guys. I, ask you a I mean, they're working well. Jennifer. <laughs> so does that make it a top billing, or does that make it a really important component, but maybe not top billing for CASA? We are using this in half of our infill projects. If okay. we didn't have this tool, we would be back in our normal mode of creative groveling, which worked for about 20 years and stopped working about two years ago. But, well, I'm not okay. suggesting that, it would, that we would undo it. I, I'm just asking is, is there anything else we can do 
that we have not yet already done, Jennifer. So, so sure. I think that's really the question for me with this particular thing because, you know, and the suggestion was is, you know, really push HCD to decertify cities that don't do what they're supposed to because then they can't get their transportation money, right? So you become decertified. You then have a, a path to not getting things, which is not particularly politically popular. But, well, but, but there has is, the there law been beefed up enough that we really, we really don't have to tilt at this windmill anymore. And Bob, I would ask you because I know you guys have done a ton of work on. This. Can can we? I, I'm afraid of I, of killing a deal right now here and there because personally I like this idea and there's several things that I think are important uh, in it. So um, okay, can so we maybe register I can that? Maybe recommend we concern? take it into the deeper quote unquote negotiation conversations, and those of you who are expert in this area can tell us what to do. Can I right. also invite the lawyers in the room who have ideas about how to make this work to co correspond with Linda and I in writing. Mark up the term sheet, add what you would do, put in specific language so that we don't have to t have a meeting about it. Just send us what we should put on that term sheet so it's as actionable and effective as possible. Number five. Oh, Amy. Sorry, did I skip you? I didn't see you. Just really quickly. We think housing elements are extremely important. We just passed legislation. We think we should allow that legislation to move forward and that there are other items that are a higher priority to focus on this year. So it's not that we ignore this altogether or not work on it at all, but in terms of top priority for CASA, we, don't, we, we think this could be taken off that list. Thank you. Okay, number five, no net loss. So I just want to... Uh, be clear, this is, um, actually I can't be clear because it's a negotiation point, never mind. <laughs> you, all, you all can read it. Uh, we would like to hear uh, commentary on what are the boundaries, what are the uh, components of no net loss for straight refusal. I think what this starts with is that a no net loss policy should be tied to some specific state law like SB 35 in its current form has some kind of no net loss policy. So that's one side of the negotiation conversation. And the other side is we shouldn't be losing units that currently house people who are at low income regardless of whether or not they're going to be benefiting by from the redevelopment will benefit from upzoning or streamlining. So. So I, I just have a comment on no net loss as someone who does it for a living uh, and who has worked on a lot of projects that are public housing rebuilds where no net loss has been the requirement is that no net loss is not free. Even in San Francisco where no net loss has been applied to the housing rebuilds, the public housing rebuilds, there have been huge federal grants to help offset the cost and the cost of keeping the units affordable, building affordable units, adding the market rate units. This is not free. And so I, I really liked and did a lot of research on this, the conservation district concept that Arlington, Virginia had, where they created like specific zones where they went after no net loss in a very deliberative way. And they had a basket of incentives to do that. And so I think no net loss by itself is a really hard thing to go do. I think we have to be very focused on how, where, when it's going to apply and create some incentive structures to do it. Great. Joseph. And, and tagging on to that, I mean, we've been able to do no net loss in Contra Costa, but we've done it, you know, through lots of hoops. But we're in a county that doesn't have a lot of money, no redevelopment money, you know, all these, even in redevelopment there wasn't money. So there needs to be some escape clause where I'm either stuck with maintaining a slum or I have to get out. And, and so that's kind of where a lot of my public housing is. Okay. Um, Bob, and then if I, do I, are those, t are those signs that are up to be commented on, Jennifer and Amy? Okay. Bob. Um, I might expand a little bit on the, <coughs> the, the microphone. Key. sorry, expand a little bit on the description and that would be to include where it says redevelopment 2.0, upzoning or transit. Also to include the uh, MTC five factor areas, which are being discussed, which those five factor areas are. Uh, affordability, VMT reduction, resilience, access to opportunity, and displacement. Kind of keep it consistent running with what the other conversations that are taking place. Thank you. No net loss. Anyone else? Derica. Um, a couple of points. One, um, displacement costs tenant money, tenants money too. Um, so just saying, like, you know, it's not free on their side either. 
when they're pushed out. Um, and then also, my understanding is that a part of this proposal is to actually disincentivize the de demolition of units. And so, you know, just to remember that, like that, the 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 putting the pr pr provision in is to get folks to think creatively about not demolishing and doing other things as well, um, rather than sort of figuring out how to fund just uh, relocation or a new unit. Okay, great, Amy. Yeah, <clears throat> we think this is really super important. We don't want to. Uh, lose our communities in the process of building. I think we're all, um, that's all part of what we're trying to do here. And so finding the right policy where you can protect existing residents so that they aren't displaced um, while we're doing the development or so that they can get compensation and relocation or, or um, that you can also, we're ensuring that there, we create inclusive communities. So um, the other piece of it is, we, if, even if there's no net loss, how do we address the existing, those, that existing community that's been displaced? Where do they get relocated? Um, A27 recommendations say that units should be located either in the new development or within the same neighborhood so that we're continually trying to create inclusive communities. The other thing, because it, there is enormous cost, whether it's an affordable housing developer or market rate developer, to do some of this, I think that we need to look at what are the provisions or the incentives or the concessions to help uh, lower some of the costs. So could you do something with density bonuses, higher levels of density bonuses? Could you do something with tax abatements, um, uh, have more flexible zoning standards, some kind of tax increment financing to fund replacement units? waive certain uh, fees, other kinds of requirements. So I think that, that we need the, a package that can make this work. And there are some ways where, yes, there's increased costs, but how can we have some cost savings in another way with the ultimate goal of wanting to protect the communities and the affordability of the existing units. Can, can I clarify this one? Because it's changed names a couple of times. This says no net loss of deed units with for, right of first refusal. Is this deed restricted units? It, at yeah, one point I'm not it, sure why it says deed units. It, okay. That was not yeah. the original proposal. I and just wanted to make sure. That's, okay. that's what's in discussion, I think, at the, at, in you know, kind of what are the incentives for what purpose, where, and for what units. Um, so if you have, if there are specific kind of incentive provisions that we need to know and review to like make this work, um, please, you know, send them to us because we're not going to have time to go into super great detail right now. We need to push forward. Yep. Yeah. I just think there's two categories of no net loss. There's naturally occurring affordable housing that happens in places right now like Hayward and East Oakland and at different scales that, that is a no net loss exercise that's very different from the no net loss of currently deed restricted units. I think the latter category is actually easier to solve for in some instances because you can figure out where it is and who lives there and that they're affordable because you can track them. The other category is much harder and has implications for those neighborhoods about how investment will happen. And so I, I do think that that category of conversation is different and how we solve for that is a different set of solutions. Thank you for that clarification. You're absolutely right. That's very helpful as we go into the further conversations about this. Okay, pushing on. Can I get a quick raise of hands on who really is excited about condo liability and wants to make any super important comments about it? You have co important comments to make about One it? Comment. Bob. You're on. One quick addition. Okay. To my, uh, my notes. I apologize. Uh, all right. My recommendation to add to that would be that for projects that use skilled and trained workforce, and I would defer to my, my friends in the labor force to come up with the language that best correctly identifies that, that a three-year statute of repose and liability re uh, uh, take Let's place. the mic, Bob. You're... Sorry. Yeah. For projects that use a skilled and trained workforce, a three-year statute of repose and liability requires showing of negligence in construction. A no, no strict liability, so the statute would run in three years. Okay. You know what those words mean, Denise? I'm sorry. Are we on 16? We moved to, we jumped to 16 because I just wanted to, like, you know, change it up for a second. I defer to whatever Bob wants. Bob this, wants. I know Anyone else about really it. excited about this one that needs to make a comment? Also, just say my recommendation is, is for small units, you know, anything under five, uh, you know, 
should be looked at differently than totally different categories and things, you know, 50 units and above. Okay, you're gonna help us do that, right? Okay, great. Uh, Scott. I look forward to learning about defect liability very quickly because obviously we need we need to uh, do some deep diving on this. Thank you. Okay. So just because Great. <laughs> so we're going to invite you to that conversation. Okay. Uh, public land. Sorry we skipped it, but just trying to kind of keep you awake. Public land. More comments on this. How close are we to a good, like, we third base? Are we hitting a home run on this one? Where are we at? Oh, Andreas. Sorry, I didn't see you. Gosh, the buttons and that. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I have some, some concerns here because um, it's kind of how it interf interfaces with other local initiatives. We've been, I think, for about 18 months now um, in a very uh, involved process with the public lands policy for the city of Oakland, and that is in our partnership with the affordable housing community, um, with community-based organizations. We actually are in the process of finalizing, hopefully finalizing this process through city council. And I think that um, part of the understanding around public lands policies, which I think this really falls into, is kind of a, also a negotiation process among the various local partners around uh, affordable housing, labor standards, environmental standards, and so forth. So I don't want to lose the complexity of the kind of relationships and com compromises that are made at a local level um, for simply pushing, you know, one, one of the components that we're dealing with at the local level. In other words, we need to talk about including other, other benefits uh, that come as a result of the sale, sale and release of public land. Okay. So in this proposal... Okay, thank you. Derica. I would just suggest that we add to areas of further negotiation, labor standards. Okay. Great. Is that a, Bob, are you wanting to talk? Your light's no, on? No. Okay. Oh, sorry. Anyone else on public land? Okay, great. <sighs> Breathe out, breathe in. Okay, we got another round, so take maybe a minute. Go to your happy place on the inside. The next conversation we're going to have are numbers 10, 11, 12, 14, and 15. Um, Denise, do you want me to be facilitating? Are you okay? Okay. I won't have a lot. I won't talk back at you on these ones because I don't know them as well. <laughs> Uh, okay, great. So the first one is the ADUs. I, I have a quick comment, yeah. if I could. Um, the last time we had a conversation about this, our little group looked at this one and said it should be broader than this and also look at missing middle housing. So I'm not sure if we think Which that Which one is this? 10. Number 10. Yes. ADUs. Uh, ADUs. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You're commenting about the ADUs. I yes. thought you were trying to make a different comment. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's one general question is should we broaden this and, and not just uh, limit it? Can you say more about broadening? What do you mean by that? Well, removing regulatory barriers to more missing middle types of housing in single family neighborhoods. Including like duplexes yes. or other sorts of forms. Okay. Yes. Got it. Got it. Yes, nods from that. Okay. <laughs> Question marks. Um, other comments on the ADU proposal? Andreas. Um, we should not, uh, two, two comments. One is um, to make sure we're not losing sight of um, life safety concerns around uh, ADUs, especially around new construction of ADUs, i.e. fire sprinkler systems, et cetera. Uh, also, we need to be cognizant of the issues around the underground economy and the in, uh, in the construction and renovation of units. It's a huge issue. I'm not sure how we address that, but I, that's something that we need to be cognizant of. Uh, and the final thing also, um, unrelated to those, is uh, we also need to really look at a process of providing assistance to homeowners to be able to, to you know, in a proactive way, uh, being able to navigate the 
the challenges around you know um, putting these ADUs together. Having done one myself, it is very, very, very challenging. Um, and if there is a proactive support, uh, I think that can go a long way, even more than re removing regulations. Um, if, fo if folks know what the regulations are, know how to address them, that that is that's half the battle. Thank you. Other comments on the ADUs? We're going to have public comment too in um, in, in about 20 minutes. No, 25 uh, minutes. I had a comment, so, Jennifer. Actually, oh gosh, uh, okay, Jennifer. Sorry. Uh, and then Matt. And then when Matt. I when I read about um, capping the impact fees on on over 500 square feet, but I also want to make sure we we think about capping them under 500 square feet, so somehow cities can't make the first 500 feet um, impossible to build. And I just thought that might just be a little gap that we need to just fill in. Okay. Thank you. Matt? Uh, I, I was confused by that same provision of why, why we want to set that sort of a, a limit. I, I very much have liked the proposals to shift fees to square footage rather than number of units so that you can be prioritizing these small units. So it, it, it seemed counterintuitive to, to cap fees for larger spaces rather than for the smaller spaces. So the fee notion on the IZ, on the ADUs, school fee law says that fees are charged after 500 square feet of net new living area. So we were trying to draw a parallel and say if they're in an ADU with any mitigation impact fee, including school fees, shouldn't be charged to f under 500 square feet of net new living area, and fees would be charged only for the square footage above that number, which I think is to Jennifer's point. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember that conversation, Denise, and we just want to get that really explicit that there's kind of no fees under 500. Is that address what you were talking about, Matt? Okay. Anyone else? Did I see another button? Just Derek. one one other thing on um, on uh, homeowner. I think for especially for low income home, homeowners who who still have their home, seniors. Uh, to Andreas's point, it would be worth thinking about. You know, maybe you can't help everybody do an ADU, but maybe you can help a specific population that's more vulnerable, and could really benefit from having a, a renter on their property but doesn't have the capacity to to make it happen. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, density bonus inclusionary alignment. Explaining this briefly, state law has, there are three state laws that govern density bonus, mitigation fees, and inclusionary that have inter interrelated kind of overlapping provisions. The state laws themselves are not clear about whether cities can do one of each, so charge a density bonus, you pay, have density bonus units, you pay a mitigation impact fee on housing, and you have an inclusionary requirement, and they're separate. So state law is unclear. There's a case law that says density bonus should be credited against inclusionary, but not every city enforces that, and the mechanism for truing them up is unclear. It also appears to be the case that cities that charge a housing fee under the Mitigation Fee Act can charge that on top of the density bonus or the inclusionary requirements, which has the effect of cratering housing production when these things start to become additive. So the purpose of this action plan is to align those three separate bodies of state law so that you do inclusion once meaningfully and that counts towards the to, um, completion or compliance with the other bodies of law. That's the intention of this particular policy. Okay, we're open for comments. So I have actually have the same comment for 11, 12, and 14. And with all the substantial work that's gone into the Housing Accountability Act and legislation around that, we'd like to include that, that we apply the HAA's provisions for determining project consistency. Essentially, if there is a substantial evidence to support a consistency determination, it's deemed consistent, language included in the HAA. And then that also, in addition to that, for all 11, 12, and 14, that provide that remedies for successful project applicant legal challenge include the same provisions as in the HAA. He'll email that to us later, I hope. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yes. That essentially means that um, if a housing project is consistent with the zoning, 
then its density and number of units are protected by state law. So it can't be reduced. Or the city is liable for Jennifer's litigation and attorney's fees and other penalties. Um, so one, and then, so it's both consistency and remedies. I think that's a okay. quick summary. Thank so it's, you. An, it's an enforcement mechanism to make sure that if we change the law, cities actually have to follow the law that we changed. Scott. Given that one of the later proposals touches on density bonus issues in connection with SB 35 changes, I, you know, I just want to flag that there's interest on our part in making sure that one density bonus isn't just decisively superior to the other, right? So we want to try to make sure that these things are in balance. So, Thank you. I want to make a comment on all of these as well um, because uh, whether or not they can actually be applied only in the Bay Area or they're in fact statewide and what that might do in terms of things that places like LA have already done. So I just want to flag that for our conversations. We don't have to talk about it right now. Bay Area only, yeah. I know. The problem is, is but that it's written I don't into know how state, it goes. Density bonus is state, it's state law. law. That's so the that's thing. the challenge. I mean, Jennifer, you're a lawyer, so you know this way more than I do. Um, I just have a comment on the tax exemption or tax discounting. Um, I do think we should look to Seattle, um, where they are giving property tax exemption for the units that are affordable in a certain inclusionary regime for a limited period of time. That this 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 whole thing on, you know, if you're going to get a density bonus and you're going to do at least some percentage of affordable, there should be some discount to the developers that are doing this. And I, I think as a nonprofit, we get it on 100% because we do 100% affordable. But I think this is really, um, in other jurisdictions and other states, this has been a very big incentive to make this all work. So not only should you get more units, you should get some kind of something um, on the property tax side that makes it work. Can I just ask Linda a question too? Because I had a question on that same thing. So if a developer does a 80-20, can they get the welfare exemption on the 20%? If the 20 is controlled by a nonprofit. So if it's not <coughs> controlled by a nonprofit, you're not eligible for the tax exemption. And Linda, uh, are, are, you, are you suggesting that any, any developer then should be eligible for that exemption on the affordable? I'm sure some of my colleagues will not agree with me on this, but if it's a substantial percentage and it is um, below a certain level of affordability, yes. And, and I think that, Denise, you know, you've been talking a lot about the 15-year tax exemption as an offset, but I, I think that this might be a little bit easier of a lift to, to see if the welfare exemption on sort of mixed income deals could be lifted just on, um, it just even opening it up to private developers. Yeah, I think for this one, we were not trying to add compl complexity to this. This started off as just a true up existing bodies of law and get them to work as they were yep. intended. And it stopped there. So it, it mentions tax exemptions for the affordable units only based on their affordable value. So if it's a 50% AMI unit, you pay taxes on a unit with that value. If it's an 80% AMI unit, you pay taxes based on that value. Today, if you're a for-profit developer, you pay taxes on all of the units at the same rate. So it, it, it makes it punitive to do inclusionary or density bonus units unless you have a nonprofit partner. So there's a bit of a workaround, but it's kind of weird and, and, it, and it doesn't work very well and it discourages people from building inclusionary and doing the density bonus. So we were trying to keep this one really simple and then put the big the big stuff in the SB 35 one, which we'll get to in a minute. So the tax abatement, the, you know, the, the bigger incentives go in that bucket. Okay. Uh, did I hear another button? Yeah. Derica? So I hear you, Denise, the tax abatement in the bigger bucket. So I'm just going to say the thing, even though it might go in the bigger bucket. But anytime I hear property tax exemption, that's a giveaway of public dollars that should come with labor standards and affordability. So just want to say that out loud. But then I also, um, I'm confused, in terms of daylighting areas of further negotiation on this one, um, I, I believe that there is a sentiment out there that these proposals could 
um, do harm to places that have a high inclusionary like San Francisco. And I just want to say, I think we need to make sure, we need to dig into that and make sure that that's, well, that's going to need to be discussed. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay, permit streamlining. fashion but in an expedited time frame so it gets rid of the ministerial provision of SB 35 so it doesn't you don't go from zero to building permit anymore under SB 35 you actually get a year and three hearings and for a developer to select that process because otherwise it's unknown how long it will take and you have no really time protections at all so in order to get a year and three hearings as your guaranteed process, if you're more than 20 units, you have to opt into this SB 35 project. And because the cost of the labor standards and the affordability requirements is high, this is where the 15-year tax abatement and other economic incentives would come into play. So that if you're a developer of more than 20 units, you will be highly likely to elect to be a, a SB 35 project which helps solve some of the labor standards questions we've had. How do you encourage people to do more union labor? How do you make that the most attractive option? It's by essentially providing some underwriting into the projects that are there. Think of it kind of like reverse redevelopment. In redevelopment, you locked in your tax increment for 30 years and it was bonded and there was a staff. In this case, for 15 years, the increment stays with the deal. It's not distributed to the taxing agencies for 15 years, and that money is used to pay for the on-site affordable and the union package and, and the other things, relocation benefits, no net loss, all the other things that projects are gonna have to do. So that's these two flavors. Okay. You all have that right. Now you're all like professional experts in this area. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're gonna learn together, Scott. As I've commented to Denise uh, in earlier stages of this process and, and just this morning, I mean, this is a bit of a math problem, right, to try to sort out how these two things integrate. And so you know, what I am going to try to figure out how to do is, is assemble re, you know, the resources to be able to do a good job at, 
at figuring out exactly what that math problem says. Because the big goal of CASA includes systemic change and delivering some you know, substantial wins for important constituencies. When it comes to this proposal, the measurement matters. So, so that's, that's m my next step is to try to f find the resources to do, the, to do a credible job of, of doing the math to de try to determine the size of the potential win in order to deliver the systemic change that will make CASA's compact, not just an entitlement compact, but something that really starts to shake up the actual production of housing. Because most of this so far is focused on getting to go to the starting line to start construction, right? Without dealing with the fact that we have a problem with shortages of contractors, 10,000, 14,000 fewer carpenters than we used to have. Those problems are, we haven't solved for that yet unless we make this sort of shock to the system work. So I look forward to, to diving deep into I take that. that as a prove it challenge and I, <laughs> I appreciate that because if it doesn't work, all we will have done is allow 20 unit or less projects to get done in under a year, which is not what we're intending. Um, Linda, I also want to repeat what Jennifer said earlier today, which is that we have folks doing some research on impact analysis on some of these proposals, and this is certainly a set of them. Like, what is this, what could this potentially, all, all of these things, what could they potentially produce? Uh, oh, wow, several lights. Okay, actually, I'm going to go with Tamika because we haven't had as much commentary, Jonathan, and then um, Linda. Um, I just wanted, this is actually a comment to, to Scott and Andreas and some of our labor partners, which is for months now I've been also concerned about the labor shortage, right? Like if we got everything right, we scaled it at the right scale that is impactful to solve the problem, what are we actually doing on developing a pipeline for the, the people to get the work done? So I'm just curious and I'd be happy to be a part of some offline conversations of your best ideas about how to do that. Because I think we actually we need to stop talking about it and put some proposals on the table um, that accompany some of these other recommendations. So I'm looking at y'all because I feel like y'all know it better than me. I have some ideas, but it'd be great to figure that out. Jonathan. <clears throat> Admittedly, much lower level than, than that comment and the comment previously uh, related to number 12. Um, there's just an inherent tension that's going to be set up regarding application completeness between cities and applicants, um, whereas the city's going to want to obviously push that for as far down the line as possible, and applicants are going to want to have that defined and as, and as soon as possible. And so there really is no uh, objective uh, point about what that is, and so that needs to be thought out because there's nothing to say that a city can't really ask you to do CD-level drawings, in essence, to get applicant to be deemed complete. Um, so it's just we need to think through that. Linda. So I, I actually support the idea of making SB 35 more broadly usable, and I think that's what these proposals are doing. Um, I, and I'm going to point to SV at Home, who and Leslie can fi um, talk about this more. I just think that it's set up in a way that's going to make it of limited utility for all of us. And so unless we do something that makes it more useful, I could use it as a 100% affordable housing developer, but that's not really the intent here. The intent here is to get more mixed use, mixed income stuff produced in a more timely fashion. And so I think we have to look at the percentages. I think there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to be on the table, probably not going to be solved in a big 28-person CASA meeting, but we probably got to come up with something that we think really works here. Because right now, it's a good hammer for big signature sites that aren't in the coastal zone or all of those other things that are on the list. And that's so few sites that I don't think it's very effective. So I think we have to come up with a way to make it work. Amy, do you have your card up? So what would be super helpful, and I think this, this may be a broader comment, so forgive me if it's somewhat out of order, but I, these, there's so much interplay between each element here, that it's hard to negotiate it independently. Uh, what may be reasonable may become unreasonable depending on what else is happening in the compact. So I think that there needs to be some way to tease out what are the, and maybe this is not the right number, but just try trying the, the idea, what are the top three most impactful 
um, most difficult need all of us to lift up priorities in each of the three P's or four P's, however you want to define it, um, and that the, the things that where there's broad consensus, that, that can move through separately with us doing, but it doesn't have to be part of the big negotiation. So we tease out those pieces that are less challenging or less controversial or maybe less of a priority, and we hone in on the, on the greatest priority items. So for this piece around upzoning and streamlining and making uh, development easier to happen with the guardrails that are needed around the protection side of it, we need to know the kind of like, and, and, may, and I know this is unrealistic because it's, uh, the law is so complex, but to have, to, to be juggling 15 different possible things versus to come up with a couple of key points and then how they interact so that we can tease out what the negotiation point. So for these, all of these that are about um, uploading, up, up zoning and streamlining, they're all going to interact with the geography of inclusion proposal, and that's something that I want us to make sure we really figure out. Um, and, and I know that basically there's a lot that we can give up as long as we know that we're getting protections for vulnerable communities, uh, or as long as we know we're getting investments in affordable housing and that we're, there's not a net loss or harm to affordable housing and vulnerable communities. Um, so it doesn't get as much as the specifics here, but I think it's more, can we structure this bucket of conversation in a way where we can um, see how, where the threads of the negotiation points are? I'm gonna make, say just that that is gonna be co-chairs, I think, in your section as we conclude today's conversation, how we're trying to figure that out, how we're getting there. Okay, so I've got a bunch of cards up, um, and this is how I saw them come up. Adi, Matt, Derica, Jennifer Hernandez. Uh, all right, so two things on SB 35. One in a San Francisco context, I know that what prevents a lot of 100% um, affordable housing projects from using SB 35 is the rezoning. Um, requirement. So if you need to be rezoned, then you're not eligible for SB 35. San Francisco has a lot of older non-residential land, and so I would encourage us to look at that as a provision to expand to allow more 100% um, affordable housing projects to go forward. Number two is um, the concept of reverse redevelopment. When I think about property tax exemptions, I think about all of the schools and county health departments that are not getting property tax dollars um, and the fear that they may have that their budgets are going to go down. So could there be a, you know, not to exceed X, you know, $500 million in year one or whatever X is to give them comfort that they um, shouldn't be too fearful that this is going to kill their budgets. Matt, oh, did I miss you, Andreas? Okay, so Matt, Derica, Jennifer, Andreas. There we go. Uh, thank you. It, it does seem like with the uh, with the, the 12 concept, there are a lot of uh, uh, other components packed in here that we haven't that we haven't discussed in much detail. In addition to those around um, uh, the, the legal cleanup and the and the CEQA exemption, there's the expanding the Housing Accountability Act. There's something about disallowing. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> reductions in, in height or density that, that seem like they'll need a, a fair amount of consideration to make sure that they're um, well thought out by the group. Um, uh, Denise and I have started to talk about if there were any um, uh, changes for these small projects needing to make exceptionally clear that, that we're very focused in urbanized areas with good project densities that are um, located near transit, that, we, that we've got the geography right from a, 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 a transit-oriented perspective, as, as well as the geography conversations that are going on around um, disadvantaged communities. Uh, and then I, I, I have a, a, a question around the first component of the uh, SB 35 um, summary here that relates to, relates to these small projects. Um, it seems like it, what's being proposed here sounds like there's a, a single hearing that's allowed for those small projects um, so we'd like to think through that, whether that's, whether that's a reasonable um, uh, s amount of streamlining for, for these small projects. We want, to, we want to see them move quickly, and we also want to make sure that they reflect good design standards and, and community input as well. 
Thank you. And just a reminder, also use the online form to put in details of the specific kinds. So, Derica. A um, few things. Um, I'm still on, so the proposal as it's written in um, the SB 35 one says to limit affordability to 15% regional cap. I mean, anything regional should be a floor, um, not a ceiling, but 15% um, but feels really low given the SB 35 goal of affordability. Um, so just want to name that. I'm also super uncomfortable still with the up to 150 um, AMI levels. I mean, that's market rate in San Jose <laughs> and most of the Bay Area. And this is an affordability tool. Um, and so I just want to name that. Um, I also think that we have to have the discussion, I mean, to Amy's point about, you know, as we're capping fees, remembering that, yes, Denise, not all of this is going to be backfilled, but we do have to backfill some stuff, and so we, how, how this interplays with revenue for local jurisdictions is important. Adi, I'd love to talk to you more about the rezone, I'm, but I'm uncomfortable with rezoning at this point, um, just because this has been talked about in the production context as, like, where there's not an, a, a, a rezone needed, but you know, glad to hear it, but I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, wanted to say that. And then big picture, we're super in the weeds in CASA right now, and I do think that as we look to the future, we're going to need to not go to principles level, but somewhere in between, because what gets introduced in Sacramento in January is not what comes out in September, and if we think we're going to get the September version by January, we're crazy. So I just want to name that. That's how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> Me too. Jennifer Hernandez. Thanks. Um, so I had a couple points about SB 35. So uh, a disqualifying criteria for use of this at all, um, uh, uh, Amy, is if there are any housing units that have ever been on the site in the past 10 years, SB 35 doesn't apply. So that was kind of the draconian but pretty clear approach to making sure it wasn't used as a displacement tool. Um, and that's, I think, not up for, for grabs. Um, I see SB 35 as a major production tool that includes affordable units, but it's not just an affordable tool. And I think its value is to, is to create the both missing middle affordable, which is up to the 150, plus then the guaranteed percentages of um, uh, affordable. 15% um, is not such a hard, I mean, if, if we're talking about up to, you know, the, the, the style of housing we're talking about, if you want SB 35 to apply outside of really unique luxury markets like Cupertino, and San Francisco, we're going to have to deal with the reality of the cost of inclusionary and the marketability. It doesn't, for example, pencil in most places in Oakland. Last point I want to make is we're going to be in a fight for our lives. SB 35, the city of Berkeley, has said is un unconstitutional. We will be suing them over that for the Spenger site. Um, if anybody wants to see all the Archeo maps proving the negative on the absence of shell mounds. I'm happy to share them with you, but that's in the city's own draft EIR. There are no shell mounds on this site, so we're, we're kind of staying with the city on that. Um, so this is a fragile tool, but with that, it's also a tool that's very much being uh, lobbied right now in the guidelines context. The HB, uh, HCD SB 35 guidelines are out. They don't have to go through formal rulemaking. They're supposed to be in effect this year. Uh, by the end of the year. It's really important for HCD to hear support for its stuff because they're getting creamed by all kinds of people, including many who uh, appeared at the, or attended the APA meeting last week, saying this is ridiculous and you should get out of our, of our cities. So please, if you can, drop a note to HCD saying it's an important tool and we encourage them to continue to work out the bugs or something like that. Okay, Andreas, and then I'm going to have to move us forward, folks. Um, two comments. One is I just wanted to follow up on what um, Tamika said about the labor supply issues. Um, and, and I do think we need to, not that I want to add yet another uh, compact element, but I, I, I think having a, a discussion about that is very important in terms of main, making sure we've got a qualified workforce. Um, because it is it is having a huge impact on costs and ab about the viability of projects. I just wanted to say, either we have that offline, or if it's something that we need to look at and see what we can do in our in 
um, at a legislative level, if there's anything there we should look at. Um, I also just want to second what Derek has said in terms of um, we are getting deep into the weeds. Um, and, and I think we don't have to maybe, I think, resolve every issue. I mean, the sausage is going to get made in Sacramento anyway. Um, so let's not, I think, let's not kid ourselves. We can come up and negotiate and come up with something that's perfect here. Um, it's going to get twisted and turned and, you know, in, in, in the political environment that is Sacramento. So I think it's okay to stay kind of, let's call it big picture, medium picture. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to fill up your baseball analogy. Strike but zone. Strike zone. <laughs> um, but, but I think certain areas we can kind of leave open, um, you know, for we can outline the issue and say here's pros and cons, here's different positions, and, and that's okay. Um, so, um, you know, let's not, uh, not uh, mm -hmm. get too deep in the weeds and, and miss the forest for all the trees. Okay. Ch Co chairs are whoever's, I know we want to do public comment too, and we've. Yes, we, uh, we're so good. We're we good. still have another one more that was coming up for today. So Okay, go, go for it. We're, we're and, okay. and we only have, sorry, Leslie, we only have three public comments. So. Okay, so if there are more folks who want uh, public comment, please get your card in. And uh, so let's, let's go ahead and do the, and I the last one. And I circulated cards, so I think that that's probably it. Four. Yeah. Okay, okay. So we're good. Great. A27, well, no. This is not about A27. This is about how do we do upzoning that takes into account a couple of factors. One, it changes exclusion to create more inclusion. So zoning that allows um, up to a minim minimum up to 36 feet, at least 36 feet in across the Bay Area, across the board. Um, and then near transit gets higher. And there's a conversation going on about within what range of transit, how far from transit, uh, how high are we talking about. Right now the proposal is that it's 55 feet that could go up to 75 with a density bonus near transit. And I'm going to use that term loosely because it could be like right on transit corridor. It could be within a quarter mile. There's this that kind of conversation. So that is what we're talking about. We're not talking about 827 as such, but that's kind of the expectation is that that's coming forward anyway next year. And this is our way of engaging in that conversation. Adi. So this is number 15, right? Note that if you have your cards up, I will call on you. Unless, unless, so if you did not intend to have your card up, please take it down. Uh, number 15. Number 15, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so uh, this, um, this topic brings up a few ideas, some of which got floated pretty recently that we haven't had a robust conversation about. So um, I'm sure a lot of folks will have a lot of thoughts on this. And it, it does relate to the, the principle of the sensitive communities. Um, I do want to thank our friends to, um, who put forth some well thought out ideas. So thank you for that. Um, but the, I, I do have a worry about um, how we're framing this, the sensitive communities conversation and the exemptions, or the, at least the potentially temporary exemptions um, for sensitive communities. As I went back to read the materials, um, it says that sensitive census tracts may opt out of streamlining large market rate projects, streamlining market rate housing um, overlay and commercial um, sites may be opted out of densities above missing middle, and plans um, plans that will that could take up to four years and maybe a two year extension, so up to six years, could opt out of any market rate or upzoning housing overlays. Um, and, and the geographies, as I read them, um, take up a lot of TOD developable sites, um, a lot in, certainly I saw a lot in Oakland, a lot in um, East San Jose, and then certainly some neighborhoods in San Francisco. Um, and I, I, get, I, I get what I think is the intent of um, having a longer period of time for certain communities to do planning. But I worry with so much, with a long up to six year exemption for these plan areas um, to really limit supply, um, to really 
it really cuts against a lot of one of the core themes I think we're about, which is how do we dramatically um, stem the display, displacement pressures by dramatically increasing supply. Um, so I, I'm concerned about that. And then I thought tactically, you know, you have these plans, they then need to get um, environmentally approved. That's a long slog that may or may not get environmentally approved. Um, there could be some um, special favors that, you know, some of us all want to tack on to plans. Um, these plans are going to cost a lot of money. Who would, who would facilitate them? Um, so it, for me, that this principle of exempting such big parts of the bay um, uh, cuts across, you know, the way that I see things, which is that it's our, it's our low supply that is exacerbating the um, disparities and the displacement pressures. Um, so I thought I was gaining a lot of comfort with, you know, um, upzoning potential packaged with the right to an attorney, packaged with the anti-gouging, packaged with a lot of um, concessions on all sides. Uh, and I think that this move that we heard about last month goes too far in the other direction. So, so I just want to clarify, Adi, um, that this is essentially the zoning tool that's the outgrowth of the inclusion conversation. And one of the principles of that was that everywhere would be rezoned for missing middle densities. So think duplex, triplex, quads in otherwise low density neighborhoods. And if you look at the maps, a lot of areas that are currently low density zoned are, not, are outside the sensitive communities. And most of the sensitive community areas by like square footage aren't in the up zone half mile radius on transit. They may overlay with the PDA, but we weren't using the PDAs as the map tool. So if you actually look at the overlap between sensitive communities and transit, um, you, you're upzoning a fair bit of single family zone land that is not in a sensitive community through this tool. And you're also upzoning sensitive communities to a missing middle density when they have low density zoning. The only thing, and we're not calling it opt-out anymore, we're trying to work on our, our messaging, you guys are training us, so we got rid of the word opt-out. Now we call it deferral. So the deferral period. Well, there's a conversation about that. Yeah, is, is all, you know, it took us like 20 minutes to come up with the word. Um, the deferral period is only for the heights above 36 feet. So when we say inclusion means everywhere, it means everywhere has some amount of upzoning if you're near transit to be defined as transit. And, and the much bigger buildings that are built by larger institutional investors, bigger capital, those will be deferred as a rezoning in the sensitive communities unless they're 100% affordable. Let me suggest, so the current yeah, so, so we're gonna take your comments, Adi, and we're gonna kind of, then we'll introduce, the co-chairs are gonna introduce how we're gonna move forward and bring some of these conversations into a, a, a deeper space. Uh, okay, Joseph. So I haven't, this is somewhat new to me, I haven't had a chance to do the background, but so can you tell me the quick thumbnail of why public housing is not eligible for the transit density? Uh, I thought we said mobile homes yes. and did we also SROs, say mobile, mobile homes, homes SROs, SROs, public housing. Um, I guess oh, this was, it came out of a San Francisco conversation where there's concern that public housing Somebody is losing, it's going to, project base section eight. I don't remember. Talk about your concern about that concern. <laughs> let's, let's so we can talk later, I guess. Yeah, well, let's so talk, I, just let's talk about it. If that's a concern it, yeah, I mean, well, for you. I guess I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're saying there. So you're not going to be able to get the denser, the upzoning, I mean, if you have public housing there? I mean, what do, I guess You're I'm trying, trying to, to prevent what it's the, the incentive to displace people who currently live in public housing or have Section 8, Section 8 housing. So, so, so that's I would, the idea. Well, I would just say broadly. I mean, so housing authorities who are redoing their public housing, they're doing it because it's old and decrepit. And you know, what you build is dense multifamily housing because that's what you can afford to build, that's what you can afford to finance, that's what's gonna look good 30, 40 years from now. My single family and duplex housing is not gonna work. So, I mean, this is gonna kill me and I don't know how I'm gonna make my properties viable for the future. 
Okay, super helpful. Bob. Uh, just real quick, the same thing, uh, similar to number five, expand it. I think it's narrowly focused right now. Expand that to the five MTC factor areas and focus housing. Um, based on the five objective factors, again, of affordability, VMT reduction, resilience, access to opportunity, and displacement. And then my, the HA provisions, I would extend again to this one as well. Tamika, did I see you also have your card up? If we could have just like one or two more, we need at 140 to, to move on. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. I I tried to understand, Denise, what you were saying in response to Avi's comment. I didn't quite get there. But um, I think for me, this one in particular is when we talked very early on about some anti-poverty interventions that overlay with our housing production, our, our protection and preservation efforts, this is a place where I think we need to be paying attention about it's because even minimum zone rezoning could uh, exacerbate displacement. And so I want us to be thinking a bit more proactively about what can we do in terms of tenant protections and or preservation of um, neighborhood community fabric that is a more proactive strategy than rezoning. And I'm, and I'm not convinced that planning efforts do that. I think that there are some more targeted anti-poverty interventions that we could think about, and I, I have some ideas about that. Super, thank you. Okay, Scott, and then you might be the last. So listening to both Adi and to the interaction between Adi and Denise, I, I realize that there are, there are important questions to clarify, especially you know, to, to interweave and it highlights the interconnectedness of, the, of these different proposals. My focus again being on SP35, there, there are numerous exclusions as was pointed out of what can be put into the SP35 uh, eligible category. And I would be concerned if this took out large quantities of potentially developable SB35 eligible projects. So I just need, for my own sake, to clarify that. So uh, I, I'll try to tap the available expertise of the room to do that. It, it shouldn't, in theory, it should create more land area zoned for housing, including areas that are now zoned commercial on transit where projects could then be eligible for SB 35. Today they would not be because they're zoned single family or they're zoned commercial. But it's the deferrals except for Sensitive projects that are smaller. Yeah that, yeah, yeah, that that I just need to dig okay, into the details enough. on. Thank you. All right, folks, this is getting real. Um, you asked for a while for this to get more real, and it's getting real. Uh, we've been way in the weeds. We're going to, you know, they're still dabbling around there. And I would con encourage you to continue thinking about what's the strike zone that we're aiming for. So again, recognizing that if this is too brittle and it gets introduced in the policy at the state legislature or wherever it might be, it will break on day one. And then our agreement and our collective effort may not hold together. So what's the space that we need to be able to hold something together that we can go through a process together at the legislate, state legislature or at MTC or wherever, where we can still see that we're in the strike zone um, and we hold together as an agreement. So that's in some ways kind of, we need to be di identifying that space um, <clears throat> that we can all hang in there together if, if we can. I mean, we may still decide we can't, but that's what we're, that we're really looking for feedback in that area, in that space. All right. Okay. Thank uh, you. All right. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Denise, uh, for that. And thank you all for your comments. I'm, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Ken for public comment, and then, and then I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair and hand it over to, to Mike to uh, do the closing. So I have uh, four cards. Uh, Shijuti, Hussain, and Tim Frank are the first two, and I don't know where the microphone is. There it is far away from where everyone is seated. Hi, I'm Shejizi Hossein from Public Advocates. And so our partners and I are um, looking for more clarity on the timeline of our negotiation process. Um, so specifically, 
uh, who will be at each step of the process, will we have agreements on accountability for each step, and when we are going to have focused conversations on these details. Um, and then also materials for each of the technical and steering committee um, meetings have been coming, the materials have been coming out pretty close to the meeting, so it's been hard to really digest everything uh, before the meetings and having, you know, coming as prepared as possible. So um, looking back at earlier documents on the CASA process, um, I saw that there was, there was talk about having these agendas out a week before the meeting. Um, so if, if we could do that, or at least a few days before, that would be very helpful. Um, and also we're looking for impacts on racial equity. So um, I know there was some discussion on um, impact analysis, but that's very important as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Tim Frank, followed by Michelle Majid. Uh, thanks. This is Tim Frank. I just wanted to remind you to begin with uh, of a comment that Jennifer Hernandez made, which I think was right on point. If you look at their work, 95% of their clients are actually uh, taking advantage of either the housing element, the Housing Accountability Act, density bonus. It's a combination of these things. They all work together. And as we look at streamlining and we think about what do we do about SB 35, what do we do about the density bonus, et cetera, we really need to think about it, how it fits into that larger picture and making sure that all these things are handled as though they were puzzle pieces that fit together to knit together the, the picture that we're looking for. Something that provides the kind of streamlining, the, the certainty that we need to actually create housing, to make it affordable to build housing, that also provides a strong incentive basis to actually use a skilled and trained workforce so that we can actually increase the size of that, that workforce. Ideally, multiplying it in, in, in size by as much as is a factor of two. Um, and making sure that we're working to connect it to uh, all the programs that, that are providing funding. So as, as Jennifer was saying, we can make sure that the projects that are streamlined also actually pencil, because it's really important to, we make to make sure that that's a piece of it. So the key is to think about this whole system holistically and look at the way that things uh, fit together and make sure that we don't, aren't leaving anything out of, uh, of that picture. So. Uh, I, I don't have specific comments on, on the topic, but I just think I, we need to keep that larger picture in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle, followed by Fernando Marti, who is the last speaker. Uh, hey, Michelle Majid from Urban Habitat and Six Winds. I'm going to change our sports analogy and go to a more global sport. I'm going to say I hope we get to a place where we can shoot penalty kicks with an empty net. Uh, I think we can get there. Um, so with that, uh, I do think to Derek's point, like let's reach for the stars in our growth around our equity analysis, but also set regional floors um, for a lot of these policies uh, as to not punish some of the cities that are doing exceptionally well around anti-displacement. Um, and with the six, or with the three Ps analogy we've been using, we also want to broaden that to include some principles around um, building community power uh, for working class folks, locally appropriate place-based policies and strategies, and punishing bad actors. So just think about that as you determine like what's the appropriate criteria. Um, want to second what Shajuthi said about having a clearer timeline and also having a feedback loop um, as we're engaging in community meetings outside of these meetings. I think let, we can't forget that this is, there is um, a bigger sort of outside strategy to get buy-in from local communities around these. Um, you know, more general things, carry this as a complete packet. Don't forget the three to five billion we need across the P's. Um, and uh, that while we're putting a lot of weight into state legislation, we just don't have as much control over that, but we do have control over Barrier Metro's actionability, for example, and that has a lot of weight. And so let's think about other tracks, other parallel tracks. Um, and I, it feels important to um, not assume that we're all coming from a sort of growth supply side mentality. Um, we're not. Uh, and I think, you know, part of that is really advocating for not privatizing public resources, for example, like housing and transportation, and really centering this around racial equity. So that's my last thought. Hi, my name is Fernando Marti with the Council of Community Housing Organizations. I want to thank you all for, God, 
all of this amazing work. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible to, to kind of read through it. Um, and I think to highlight the name of this process, to house the Bay Area, and this is the committee to house the Bay Area, and to and, you know, do that through protecting, through preservation, through production, and to dramatically increase supply. And I want to reiterate that. The goal here on the production side is to dramatically increase supply. It is not to dramatically increase profits if it does not result in supply. Um, I think recognizing where we are, and it's an affordable, as a housing crisis, a crisis of supply, which is a crisis, if you look at the data, it's since 2008, we are producing half the housing that we were producing through the 90s, through the 2010s, up until 2008. And that is the decimation of single family housing. We are producing the exact same numbers of multifamily housing that we've been producing decade after decade. So we're trying to, uh, uh, replace cheap housing with really expensive housing that costs seven hundred thousand dollars a unit to build um, and so I think what that means here is really emphasizing uh, affordable housing streamlining for affordable housing funding for affordable housing and as many of the comments uh, were about missing middle you know what is that less expensive housing that isn't getting built right it is not about entitling more housing where we already have 45,000 units entitled and not being built, as in San Francisco, right? It is not about streamlining in areas that we already have met our 100% of our market rate housing needs. Um, so just on the, on the specifics of 11, 12, 14, and 15, uh, I think uh, 12 is fantastic the way it's been written as a, this is actually to create housing with a use it or lose it provision. You get to you know, streamline, move forward, but you gotta do it in 24 months. This isn't about profiting off of your entitlements. 15 makes a lot of sense. I disagree with Adi. We've worked very hard on saying, how do we get this missing middle housing everywhere? And how do we protect communities that are at risk, right? Uh, 11 and 14 to me are simply, I think, non-starters. 14 in, in terms of SB 35, where SB 35 is not working in those areas that have not met their market rate housing needs, then there are things to be solved there, right? And we should be working on that, and whether that's incentives for production, whatever that is, that is a problem to be solved. But saying, let's make SB 35, let's lower their inclusion area where in cities that are already meeting their market rate housing need, seems contrary to the whole proposal. And then finally on 11, we uh, worked with uh, Assemblymember Ting trying to push a bill at the state. Unfortunately, it, it didn't work. State density bonus in San Francisco, where we have an 18% inclusionary housing uh, provision, use of the state density bonus actually reduces our inclusionary housing to 13%. That is going backwards. The idea of state density bonus is you get a bonus if you produce more affordable. That's what it was about. It wasn't about upzoning by 35%. If what this committee wants to do is upzone the entire Bay Area by 35%, then let's put that on the table. So that's my comments. Thank you for listening. Okay, that was the last one? Okay. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike, and then I think Jennifer has some final comments. Wow. <laughs> um, so I wanna take us back a few months or longer and, and um, the last public speaker kind of commented on it, which is the purpose of this group, which is to house the Bay Area. And, and I, I get hung up sometimes when I hear the silos start to pop up and everybody has their own sort of protectionist about their own activity. And I've been up in Sacramento now a couple times. I've met with all the politicians up there that have something to do with this in the Senate, the Assembly, uh, our caucus. And I want you to know that those people are actually really excited about what we're doing. They actually have a sense that this organization called CASA is going to come up with a big package. They're enthusiastic about how to make something work that doesn't fragment and spin off and um, take the easy stuff or take a few at a time because they realize that's what we've been doing. We've been fraught with that exercise in Sacramento for a long time. So, so I think if we're going to get through this, 
Um, I think we have to hold on to that original concept. This is a big package. And where it runs into the issues of getting it done, there may be some solutions. The, the San Francisco Bay Area Caucus is meeting in January for their annual retreat. There's a possibility we can get them this, this 17, let's call it, hanging on by a thread, items, and, and they're going to try to deal with it as a package. I know that sounds strange to those of you who do this for a living, but, but that's kind of what they've been using the words. And I, as usual, I go up to these places, I have no concept what these people do for a living because I'm, I'm not in politics. So I always start off with, I'm outside the box. I don't know what you folks do, but let me ask you if you can do this. And I, it dawned on me, we were up there this week, Leslie and I were meeting with some folks, and, and it was, I said, you know, think about the Declaration of Independence. And this gets back to our too much detail, not enough detail. By the way, you all asked for a lot of detail in the last few meetings, so be careful what you ask for. Um, so we went up there and said, you know, the Declaration of Independence was a bunch of sort of general ideas. It was a proposal to get away from King George. And our proposal is to, to declare a declaration of housing, if you will. But the Constitution is where the, the rubber met the road. That's where all the amendments showed up. And, and, and little simple ideas like uh, the right to bear arms became, what the hell does that mean 200 years later, right? So we're never going to solve all the details. We're never going to solve all the specifics. But I think we have to have the continuing saga that we're going to come up with a bunch of ideas. They're going to be uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of degree of difficulty and degree of detail. But if we can hold on to, I think, the concept of this one big thing, I think it has a shot, and I think those people are actually anxious to hear it. The governor talks about CASA all the time, the future governor, sorry. Um, uh, I think I did that last time. Uh, but the intended future governor that I think we all expect um, you know, is excited about the CASA proposals and, and the two heads of the, the two bodies. So as, as your favorite uh, French uh, guy Voltaire said, you know, let perfection not be the enemy of the good. So we are not going to get this perfect. We're not going to solve everything. But I think about it is if we just build some more of those, that's a success. And if we can get some more of this, that's a success. And if we get some more of affordable and, and for, for profit and middle, and we can protect a lot of people and we can do all of those, they're not all going to be perfect. Uh, but we will have made a tremendous uh, impact on the Bay Area like has never been done. No one's ever tried this approach. Steve, I can't uh, tell you how many times I've told him I hate him for this idea, but, but it may be his most brilliant creation ever, that if you get all these people in the room who are clearly disparate in their viewpoints and clearly have different um, agendas, but if you can put your agenda at the door, and come back in here and say, wow, what do you know? We created some housing. Maybe it was 20 units and they weren't with PLAs. Or maybe they, the affordable didn't do. Whatever those issues are, uh, so what? Right? We move the ball down the field. And I think this group, if it focuses on that agenda, the big arm around everybody here, I think we can do this. I think we can get it done. It's not going to be easy. We are, you saw today the detail devil. Um, and... Uh, but I think it's doable. I think the guys in Sacramento and the gals up there, are they want this to work. And as I said, uh, anything that improves on it is a home run. So that's my up-to-date Sacramento, it can be done, maybe, sort of, <laughs> speech. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just say, I think he was a cheerleader in high school. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. So keep that in focus, yep. please. Uh, just before I wrap us up, I just wanted to see Fred or Steve if you guys had any closing remarks. Nope. Yep. All I got is what Mike said and do it in the next 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make it not. Um, so let me talk about next steps then. Um, we're going to take today's feedback and we will capture it in the term sheets for the co chairs and Steve. Um, the moderators or, or the staff team will follow back up with some of you who had super specific things on, on details that we need to capture in those. 
Um, the next meeting, because of Thanksgiving, is the second Wednesday. Just want to remind everybody, so it's on November 14th. And we're going to hear the final set of term sheets. There's only three or four of them. There's just cause, regional inclusionary, capping impact fees, and, and redevelopment. Uh, we're also, uh, the MTC team is working on the numerical analysis so we can really see the impact on each of the three Ps, and that's underway. Um, and then finally, we're going to come back to you and the co-chairs and Steve are working with, on this about thoughts about the form of the compact. So Mike gave you a visual of the Declaration of Independence, so I think it's going to look something like that um, uh, with signature blocks and uh, some whereases and, and some... Um, um, some specifics, and then uh, we're also going to come back to you on some thoughts on implementation. Uh, so that's going to be the November agenda. And I hear uh, you all on the trying to get the term sheets out earlier. I will just tell you that it takes 13 people uh, to pl plus extended networks to get this this done, and the moderators are working weekends and evenings, and so are we, and it has to go through many people before we can kind of get them out. So it's only a four week turnaround, we'll do our best. Um, but I think Wally also um, emailed out the packages and so I can't promise you it's gonna be a week in advance, we'll, we'll do our best. But I think that it's really also important to make sure that all the feedback is in the, the final set of term sheets that you're gonna see. Um, and with that, I guess I just asked the moderators, uh, any other thoughts to add before That's we close one. out? I think Fred had. Oh, and then Fred? Fred just one thing, and I haven't discussed this with the moderators or the co-chair, so I'll apologize in advance. Um, one, I, I just want to provide a heads up on a couple of things. You know, Steve just mentioned we've got, you know, he kind of joked 30 days, but it feels like 30 days or less. And, um, you know, we have struggled mightily with how to get to the finish line using our existing structure. So, I mean, we, we've mapped out steering committee meetings and technical committee meetings for uh, the remainder of the year, and we try to figure out how to fit everything into that. And I am frankly not certain that that's answering the right question. Um, I think that we need to be asking the question, what is the structure and set of structures that get us to the finish line? rather than how do we get to the finish line using everything that we're currently encumbered by. Uh, and so I want to say that to say we will require, I think, at some point, everybody's flexibility to show up at a meeting that isn't necessarily on the calendar today in order to get to the finish line so that we are not kind of wrapping ourselves up in the pretzels trying to uh, get everything to the finish line using everything that we have today. So I just want to kind of ask everybody for a greater degree of flexibility over the next 60 days so that we can get this over. The second thing that I think is related to that is it will require more than us coming to technical and steering committee meetings. There are some people around this table who we are going to need access to in order to negotiate something, and I hope that people are available for that kind of uh, discussion as well. Last thing I want to say is, in terms of getting materials out on time, I think there is a trade-off here. We can get materials uh, out on time that are a week behind, or we can get you out materials that are closer to the time that we are meeting that it's up to date. Um, and so members of the public and others are going to have to have a little patience with us over the next period of time as well um, and understand the trade-offs that we're working here because we are trying to get something to the finish line in real time. Uh, and so we can get something to you a week in advance, and it'll be literally a week behind where we are. So can I uh, put a little more detail to that? So we are, in fact, is it, I'm going to say it. We are, in fact, scheduling some intensive conversations about some of the interlinking points that Amy and others raised um, so that we can have those cross conversations. So we're in the process of trying to schedule that now. Um, so that by the November technical committee meeting, we will hopefully have drawn the strike zone much more 
as precisely and with a lot more agreement. Um, and um, we're also working very hard to bring up to speed some of the steering committee members who haven't been had as much space to interact with this um, and getting them more and having more more ongoing conversations. So sometimes the week delay of a publication of something it means it's been because there's been 20 conversations during that week that are informing some of the thinking. So if y'all want to be part of that, let us know and we will make sure you get booked. And Fred, I want to thank you for your comments because I think that's that's really true. We are we are every day is is the ball gets more developed and and thank you Jennifer and um, the Google Forms document is still open. Sarah's adding the four new term sheets to it. When we get the final set of term sheets, they'll be added to it. So that's one vehicle to comment. The other way to comment is to reach out to any of the moderators. Uh, what we don't want is anybody withholding comments so, that we, so we don't have time to, in, to incorporate those. So um, we'll continue to take your feedback through the Google Form. Again, please let the moderators know if you if you want to be part of some of the intensive conversations. Um, and I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you, the moderators, for facilitating a great dialogue. And thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>